Okay, this is my my president of my neighbor council. He said put in a card for him. Okay. I'm not putting in a card. I don't think. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. so that's right. Right. Can I hold this for you? You have another you, one? You know what? I do. Oh, Only for you. Okay. Oh, you're going to find The Board of Neighbor Council. I mean, all the weirdos are here today. Yeah. I guess she's still trying oh to make it. Good. Oh, yeah, I see one right there. Oh, my God. I see a couple I haven't seen in years. <laughs> oh, yeah. I thought they had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> one through five. I think we share as, as general public. Yeah. Hey, buddy. I'm glad I got back at We're here. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this special meeting of the Education and Neighborhoods Com Committee. It is Tuesday, February 16th. The time is... 317. I'm Paul Krikorian, the chair of the committee. Um, Council Member Zine is uh, in another committee right now, but he will be coming down uh, momentarily. Uh, but the way we're going to commence today, uh, typically in our committee meetings, we uh, have general comment at the conclusion of the meeting. Uh, in light of the special nature of, of this meeting and the fact that we are dealing with a single council file today, although we've broken it up for simplicity uh, into five agenda items for today's meeting, we are dealing with a single council file and a single, the single general topic of the CAO's recommendations regarding neighborhood councils and uh, done. So the way we're going to proceed today is uh, with general comment at the general public comment at the beginning of the meeting. Um, so if you would like to uh, offer comment, please be sure to submit a, a speaker card. And then in addition to that, uh, if there are people who wish to speak about individual agenda items on the numbers one through five beyond what they've offered at, uh, at general comment, you'll have that opportunity to, to do as well. Um, in in the general comment period, we're going to provide two minutes uh, per speaker. Uh, and then I think for the agenda specific items, uh, we will go ahead and limit it to one minute. Um, so, uh, so as we start off, you'll have a better opportunity to speak now at the beginning. And uh, we are now joined by Council Member Zine as well. Council Member Zine, welcome. So, um, this special meeting uh, will be considering the CAO's recommendations on the three-year, uh, on his three-year plan uh, relating to the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment and Neighborhood Councils. Uh, I want to thank many of you for having really stepped up and, and uh, come together in your communities to try to find recommendations for how we proceed uh, with neighborhood councils in a way that will create cost efficiencies and um, still uh, also address the very important function that neighborhood councils uh, serve in our city. Um, I think we need to say, I need to say at the outset that uh, I recognize, uh, as do I, I'm sure many of my colleagues, that neighborhood councils serve a tremendously positive uh, service uh, to our community, especially at a time when we're cutting so many uh, of our services, when we're restricting budgets. Uh, the volunteer services that the members of neighborhood councils provide as sort of the eyes and ears of the city and, and fulfilling many of the unfulfilled needs um, that in, in each of our unique communities is a tremendously valuable asset uh, that we in the city should recognize as a special asset. Uh, and it also is important to know the special nature of the neighborhood council movement and its uh, unique place as a uh, uh, as a form of government that is is largely unprecedented. Uh, the uh, 
formalization of this kind of experiment in, in direct democracy uh, sprang out of um, uh, a great deal of unrest and unease with how the communities were being represented. Um, and so here in Los Angeles, we created this institution. Um, the people created this institution. And uh, I think it's very important that as we uh, recognize the budget realities that we're facing right now, that we don't allow um, these the crisis of the moment uh, to be used as an excuse uh, to dismantle uh, or uh, disempower the neighborhood council movement that has played such an important uh, role for our city. Now, that being said, um, of course, we all know and recognize that the city faces immense uh, budget challenges right now, uh, budget challenges that are unprecedented in our lifetime. Uh, we're facing a deficit in this current fiscal year of some $200 million, uh, and in the next fiscal year of in excess of $400 million, which means that the council has the task over the next few months of finding over $600 million in budget solutions for the next 18-month uh, period. Um, that is a gargantuan task that is certainly going to mean uh, very, very deep cuts in virtually every area of public service uh, and every area that the city uh, is engaged in spending money in. Um, so that's the reality that we have to work uh, with. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, all of your input as to how we can meet those, uh, those needs together. Uh, Council Member Zine, welcome. Do you have any uh, opening comments that you'd like to make? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say publicly that I am a former Vice Chair of the Charter Reform Commission, and in that capacity helped establish neighborhood councils a number of years ago, prior to uh, being elected to the City Council. And we know that there's been some concerns, there's been some issues, there's been financial considerations. There's been some neighborhood councils who've done extremely well. There's been some neighborhood councils who've had to have civility brought in by Rabbi Freeling. So it runs the gamut from the most positive to sometimes the negative and most recent negative with my 41 years of Los Angeles Police Department experience. Some folks are going to jail for embezzlement of public funds. But I look at neighborhood councils as the neighborhoods getting together to do what's beneficial for the neighborhoods. I want to see them continue, but I want to see them continue without the arguments, without the hostility, and with the proper funding to get what needs to be done. I don't think that if you've looked at some of the files that the police department has, it's very disturbing that some individuals have crossed that line such as we've seen with politicians, we've seen with clergy, we've seen with a lot of people in our society. We need to have safeguards within neighborhood councils. We need to have safeguards so we don't have these situations take place. So I don't think they should run without any funds, but I think they should recognize, as the Chair has stated, we've got some major financial difficulties in the City of Los Angeles where the Mayor's talking about pink slipping one to 3,000 city employees. That's a major issue. That means fewer services. And the taxpayers of the city of Los Angeles are not seeing their taxes reduced, but they're seeing the level of service reduced. And that affects them. It affects the city employees who are going to get a pink slip. My colleague, who has a distinguished career as an attorney, is a former member of the state legislature, and who's been well-versed in activities here in the city of Los Angeles as far as a council member, I'm very proud to serve with him on this committee. And I think what this committee will do what's beneficial to the Neighborhood Council leadership, the Neighborhood Council Commission. I know we have a commissioner from my district that's here, and I thank you for being here. He's always very committed to Neighborhood Councils. So you're not looking at people here on council who are adversarial. What we are is concerned, as many of you are concerned, and I think that's why you're here, to make sure it works to the advantage of the people of Los Angeles. What we have here is the Ethics Commission. We have the FPPC that monitors us. We have the press that monitors us. But I look at a situation with a neighborhood council treasurer who's been arrested for robbery, and you folks don't know that. You're not privy to that. We need to make sure that it's a clean system so it benefits the communities, benefits the diverse communities of Los Angeles. 
You have a doctor who can deliver babies. Dr. Weissman can deliver babies. Not anymore. He just catches them. He catches them. <laughs> and he's devoted many years of his retired life to neighborhood council. So you, you've got a lot of talented people. We want to assist in that. And we also want to make sure there's safeguards. And that's what I think it really comes down to. So we talk about the rollover. We talk about the funding. We talk about this. And I get hundreds of emails. I'm sure my colleague, our chair, gets hundreds of emails. We want to do what's right. So no one's here to destroy neighborhood councils. No one's here to eliminate neighborhood councils. But we've got to be serious about how we're going to be able to fund the operations. And you've got a general manager who uh, is trying to manage a ship with fewer mates on the ship. And it's difficult to steer that ship when you don't have a lot of folks who are navigating that ship. So that's what we're faced with, and we're here to hopefully resolve it. So, Mr. Chair, I know we've got a bunch of public comments, and uh, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Zion. Um, just to, to review quickly, uh, as I mentioned, it's a single council file, five general agenda items that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, the uh, first is the um, uh, CAO's uh, recommendation of a, uh, you know what, I'm not going to do this because I don't have my reading glasses. Here, try these. <laughs> See if these work. Thank you. Wow. Is that good or bad? Is it the blind leading the blind? Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> Let's just go to general. I think you've all seen the agenda, so we'll just leave it at that. Uh, so we're going to begin with our, uh, our general public comment uh, first, and then we'll come back, as I mentioned, to specific agenda items. Um, and to begin the um, general comment, uh, three speakers uh, representing uh, Budget LA, uh, Stephen Box, Doug Epperhart, and uh, Dr. Weissman, uh, have asked to come up together, as I understand it, or are they yielding time to you? Okay, they're going to be coming up uh, together. Um, you'll collectively have your two minutes each, so you'll have six minutes uh, in which to uh, offer your comments together. Stephen Box uh, of Budget LA. Over the last six weeks, we've convened several sessions, and it's been a robust uh, participatory process. So we stand before you with uh, some positions we'd like to present, because we believe that now more than ever, it's imperative that we work together to address the city's budget crisis, the reorganization of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, the uh, Neighborhood Council system. And so uh, we would like to make that simple presentation to you. Uh, Doug Epperhart, Coastal San Pedro Neighborhood Council. On February the 5th, I passed my eighth year as a member of the Neighborhood Council Board in our area, which I guess makes me the Dean of Council so far. A few things uh, I'd like to remark on. Uh, this crisis is an opportunity for the Neighborhood Council system. This may be the one bright spot that you all have to consider as you are going through this uh, operation of uh, dealing with the city's finances because there are 1,600 of us and you don't have to worry about our contract, laying us off, cutting our hours, furloughing us, or anything else. And in fact, we will continue to serve, probably giving more to the city and doing it with less. We've come together in a very civil manner. Uh, we understand that there are oh, as many as five bad eggs out of the 3,000 people who have served on neighborhood council boards over the last eight years. And as uh, Councilman Krikorian knows, I spoke at uh, the uh, press conference that Wendy Gruel held where we, she talked about the audit. And many of us are perhaps as severe on those who are thieves as you all are. We don't like them either. Okay, with regard basically to the five items, what we're doing now is proposing a plan to restructure the neighborhood council system in such a way that every bit as much money as the CAO has proposed will be saved. It will work better for the department. It will work better for the neighborhood councils. And as we go through these items in the coming, oh, I don't know, half hour or more that this meeting will take, um, We'll be talking about them specifically. Right now, I understand the major money items are the rollover funds, which, as we are, will point out, is not $1.61 That happened to be the balance in neighborhood council 
uh, Treasury as of June 30 of last year, there was a lot of money in the pipeline things that were had been submitted, bills that had been submitted, and the department at that time was in some cases taking as long as three months to pay those bills. We would like a full accounting of that. Are you saying it's higher or lower? I don't know. Okay. It may, I, I suggest it may be off by as much as 50 percent. There are some ideas about where that money could be parked in the interim, uh, such as the reserve fund, which might help out. I won't call it a loan, but you know, that might help the bottom line as we go forward to figure it out. Uh, and then, of course, the funding for neighborhood councils in the coming year and beyond. Uh, we hope working with the mayor's office, which we are talking to now and we'll probably be meeting with before the end of this week, to restructure things in such a way that money savings will allow that 22.5 number to be somewhat higher, uh, maybe not all the way to 45 but as close to it, to it as we can get. So we are working together. We are stepping forward to work with you and with the mayor's office to save the money that needs to be saved and, and actually improve the neighborhood council system. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. The details of the proposal will be before you. I've been the secretary of the LANC coalition and have been taking the minutes of this activity. Since the first of the year, we have had eight meetings. Almost every Saturday, there's been one or two meetings. Started with 27 people on our usual meeting on January 2nd, but every meeting since then, on January 10th, on January 23rd, on January 30th, on February 6th, and last Saturday, February 13th, there have been more than 60. Last Saturday, there were 85 people. You have 50 people in front of you right now. The neighborhood council people have been spending this time considering aspects of our city budget. Today, we will probably focus on our own particular funds, but that's small potatoes in comparison to the whole thing. It's my firm belief that our councils are very much more concerned with the whole big package. You have before you in this room and in the 1600 neighborhood council board members and in the thousands of other people who are involved with neighborhood councils, one of the best resources in town. Doug spoke of the fact that there, there's nothing to be uh, paid to them. They don't want money. They want participation. They want to be engaged. We have not been. We've been asking to be part of the process for all the, of this decade, essentially. I go back almost as far as Doug. And the important thing here, I think, is the volunteerism that's in front of us. 270 people representing 75 or more of the neighborhood councils, and there's only 90 of them, have to be essentially a representation of all the neighborhood councils before you. Changing the relationship between the neighborhood councils and the city is vital. It is one of the ways we can save our city. And I encourage you to propose more ways to involve neighborhood council in Dunn and in every other aspect of our city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker will be Heinrich Kiefer, followed by David uh, Levine. My name is Heinrich Kiefer, Historic Highland Park Neighborhood Council. I serve as interim. I've served in capacity treasurer for three years. Uh, president for two years, and I'm back to help my council by serving as president to the last part of this uh, session. All I can say is I support uh, Budget LA's proposal. I've attended many of the meetings. I'm a part of LANC. Uh, use us. We can help save the city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker will be David Levine, followed by uh, I'm sorry, Joanne Ivanic Garb. Hello, I'm David Levine, a Neighborhood Council's Services Provider. Council members and fellow Angelinos, our budget crisis demands fast and bold solutions. The Budget LA Group's proposal to save money, make government more effective, and partner with the city is a solution with appropriate <clears throat> checks and balances, prudent budgeting, monitored funding, and cost-effective elections. It's a win-win-win for you, neighborhood councils, and the city. Due to you and your colleagues' support, 
Neighborhood councils have been created and work all over Los Angeles on issues that concern all of us. Thousands of volunteer neighborhood council member hours have been donated to public-private partnerships for law enforcement, disaster recovery, business, quality of life, and other community involvement, and in helping to solve our budget crisis, outreaching, advising, and serving your constituents and voters and the city. These first responders and others have proven they've got your back when there's a crisis. Now is no different. There are many other volunteers ready, willing, able, and energized to help you. Neighborhood councils have created opportunities for involvement for thousands of people in their communities, city government, and democracy. Neighborhood councils help you and your fellow Angelinos create financial solutions. Let's re-engineer the system, not destroy it. Let prudent neighborhood councils keep most of their annual funding and rollover funds and maintain an effective and independent Department of Neighborhood Empowerment to partner with neighborhood councils. Your continued support of the neighborhood council system will help you and your fellow Angelinos get through the current financial challenges and improve government services. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Mr. Levine. Uh, next is Joanne Ivanek Garb, followed by Charles Lindenblatt. Joanne Ivanek Garb, West Hills Neighborhood Council. I was elected to Neighborhood Council two and a half years ago. Um, neighborhood Council is the way I became involved in the community. It would have been impossible for me to run for an office, too cost prohibitive. But running for a Neighborhood Council position was more feasible. Because of my involvement, I, have, I am now teaching my children to give back to the community. My son Jacob is a student rep on our board of directors, and he's 15 years old. And he's been to, as Mr. Zion can attest, he's been to council chambers, OK? I was appalled to hear that people would steal from their neighborhood council. That, that just goes against my grain. And we look at the safeguards that we have in place in our neighborhood council and what we have to do how many hoops we have to jump through to get money approved. It just, it just boggles my mind. Um, last year, we stepped up and we took a 10% hit on our funds. And we have, now we have provided something that is more uh, feasible and doesn't cut the way, cut our funds and cut our abilities to help the community. Um, but just one uh, side note, my husband says that I don't have time to work at a real job because I give too much of my time to the, to the city and to the kids. So this is my full-time job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Charles Lindenblatt, followed by uh, Yvonne Spiegel. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, my, my name is Charles Lindenblatt. I'm with uh, Mid-City West Community Council. However, I'm, at this meeting, I'm speaking for myself only. I, uh, I've been involved with the neighborhood council system since uh, after it was uh, um, developed and, and certified, and our neighborhood council uh, had been certified. and. 2002 and so forth, and I've uh, been serving as a, a board member there, and uh, I'm I'm here basically to to uh, uh, speak against uh, making the the severe cuts that uh, that were proposed, particularly in in the area of uh, uh, sweeping the rollover funds and uh, cutting our budgets in half. Uh, a number of uh, the councils out there are uh, are considerably. Uh, Larger than larger boards than others. For example, our, we, uh, our neighborhood council has uh, we have 40, 45 members on it. I believe we're one of the largest boards in the you know in the city and so forth. And so we need you know certain uh, resources uh, uh, to uh, survive and to do our jobs. Um, uh, you know, rent and so forth and, and so on. Uh, as well as we we actually hire somebody to. Uh, to uh, handle minutes and all of that, uh, and uh, every, everybody would have to would ha have to step up quite a bit more if, uh, if the funds were cut in that area. Um, uh, in addition, we uh, just as a as a board, we need, we're you know we're required to follow various uh, uh, 
state laws and the Brown Act and so forth, and and uh, certain uh, uh, resources are, are needed uh, for us to uh, to be able to uh, fulfill our, uh, our to do our, our jobs while uh, be, you know buying while uh, being uh, in uh, uh, in compliance with the law. So we I urge you not to make the make the cuts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Mr. Spiegel, followed by, I'm sorry, Robert uh, Cherno. Chir sorry. Hello. Um, my name is Ivan Spiegel. I'm the parliamentarian at the Venice Neighborhood Council, but I'm not actually an elected board member, so I'm speaking as a stakeholder today. Um, what you're looking at here, and, and I think you both really hit it on the head, you've got an army out here. You've got an army of free workers who are willing to pick up the slack that the city can't provide right now. We're like the 99 cent store of, of, you know, of city workers. What we're talking about in terms of numbers here, this year we get $45,000. That doesn't even pay for one city worker, and each of us in each of these councils, there's 90 of them, there's probably 75 to 100 people involved that are working for this $45,000. Now, how far would that go if it were actually a city paid worker? Um, some of the things that we do that we've been picking up the slack, and you probably have heard, you've all heard about the Chatsworth with the train crash and the neighborhood council came in. We've been working on creating block captains to go around and map where all the cutoff valves are at every house on every block so that everyone on the block knows if there's an earthquake, or, you know, where the, where the gas is, where the water is, what to do. These, we do at-risk youth programming. We've created an emerging, emergency preparedness flyer that we pass out to everybody. We were told that if ever there's an, an earthquake or, in our case, a tsunami, we can't count on the police and fire department. They have their own protocols. We have to pick that up. We were told that we figured we'd just go to one of the schools, would be an emergency shelter. Uh-uh. They have their own protocol. They said, don't bother coming here. We have to set that up with the Red Cross. Um, and these are the kind of things that we're picking up. The last thing I want to real quickly is talk about the rollover money. We've encumbered a lot of this money already. We figured that we had it. We give 50% of our budget to community improvement funding projects. It's gone out into the community. We've signed agreements with these people. It's been allocated. If you take this away from us, um, I predict you're going to have some lawsuits because people are really counting on that money to do work in the community. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ch Chernow. Chernow, thank you. My name is Robert Chernow. I'm with Los Angeles for Fair Government. I've provided you with our press release along with an email from the general manager of uh, Dunn, uh, Bangwon Kim. Uh, we've had great concerns about this spending for a number of years. I was one of the biggest supporters of neighborhood councils from the very start. I was on a neighborhood council, and then we started seeing some concerns with conflict of interest, with uh, violations of the Brown Act, with misspending of public funds. Uh, we did our own audit quite a few years ago at my expense, and we discovered that monies were being inappropriately used. And we were assured by the city at that time that it was a learning experience, that the neighborhood councils needed time to understand how the process worked. Now, years later, in fact, several of them, as you've already mentioned, uh, Councilman Zion, have been prosecuted and convicted of stealing uh, monies, including one gentleman who used it at a casino. Uh, there's been charges at beauty parlors, wig shops, limousine services, hotel rooms, uh, airplane tickets, the list goes on and on, uh, 11500 for cooking lessons. Um, it's outrageous where the monies have been spent at a time where employees of the city of Los Angeles are being told that they're going to lose their jobs. It's not a, a time to allow this to continue to go on. And the dilemma that uh, the city has is that they don't have enough auditors as it is to monitor where these monies are going. There was $16,000 that was given to a company for uh, surveillance cameras for Pico Union Neighborhood Council in 2007. They never received the cameras to this day. 
Uh, the general manager did absolutely nothing to assist in this matter. There's $160,000 that was left in a bank account at Bank of America in 2007. Those monies have never been recovered. Several of the neighborhood councils have complained to the general manager pertaining to alleged criminal activity. He's told them to hold grievance committee meetings rather than turn it over for uh, possible prosecution. There are several pending right now, including the current one, $150,000. His name is James Harris, who's being charged with uh, fraud and several other numerous uh, 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 counts. Uh, it's outrageous to us in the communities that we see that this is how the money is being misspent. I'd just like to very quickly state uh, that the general manager sent an email to another staff member indicating that they have to stop drinking during uh, working hours because he still has a hangover. This is the way the mismanagement is going on, and we're really asking that something be done here. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mike O'Gara, uh, followed by Barbara monahan -Burke. Uh, thank you for your opening comments. You hit a lot of the points that uh, I would hit. Uh, we are a service unit. We fulfill many needs. Uh, the neighborhood councils are, are I would say, teenagers, uh, starting out in 1999, and we, we, we've just learned to walk, and we're maturing as we go. The, ro the rollover funds weren't spent because Every, nobody knew exactly what it was they were supposed to do or what they wanted to do or the best way to improve their neighborhoods. And now in the past year, I think you'll find that a lot of that money is encumbered. We've, uh, we've spent a great deal of our money in Sun Valley and uh, uh, doing different things with, uh, uh, we've supported uh, police programs. We uh, just bought the Jaws of Life for uh, our neighborhood fire department, uh, uh, pr library programs. Uh, park programs, Halloween, Easter, Christmas, the baseball and basketball season, uh, and uh, different things with the schools. So um, uh, please, I think we need the money that we're getting now, and I think that uh, the rollover funds should re we should keep one year uh, of rollover instead of what we've been allowed in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. O'Gara. Um, next speaker is Barbara Monahan-Burke followed by Barry Johnson. Good afternoon. Barbara Monahan burke Studio City Neighborhood Council Board Member, but speaking personally. Um, the city charter is the law. The city charter mandates both the establishment of a citywide system of neighborhood councils and also the funding of neighborhood councils to ensure that they can carry out their mandated functions. The plan providing the Neighborhood Council goals, policy, and objectives shall be consistent with the law, which is the City Charter, and the Neighborhood Council's regulations and powers set forth in the City Charter are binding on all City departments and officials. The Charter states that there shall be input by NCs prior to decisions being made by the Mayor and City Council on the budget. The City Council, the City Council committees, boards, and commissions. NCs monitor delivery of city services, have meetings with officials of city departments, and may even have public hearings prior to City Councils making a decision on a matter of local concern. I'm going to give you another large paragraph and continue with this ending. Only a city charter amendment voted on by the people can alter the mandate that establishes the NCs and mandates that they have adequate funding to enable them to carry out their mandated function. Neither the mayor, the city council, nor the city controller has the authority to change the mandate of the city charter. Only we the people can do that. Any attempt to narrow or alter the mandate will be met with grassroots movement to reinforce the neighborhood council's mandated existence and funding and to strengthen and enhance their functions. All within our city government should let neighborhood councils be recognized and funded to the full extent and intent of the city charter, the 45,000 with a two-year rollover, please. And if you could, these are for your records. Thank you. The next speaker is Barry Johnson, followed by Carol White. Hi, Barry Johnson, Studio City Neighborhood Council stakeholder. Um, I just first wanted to uh, 
remind each of the committee members um, that Lisa Sarkin sent you an email. She couldn't be here today because she's ill, but she's definitely here in spirit. Um, regarding the budget for the neighborhood councils, it's a little, if you take 45,000 times 90, it's a little over $4 million. To me, it's the biggest bang for your buck this city has in any way, shape, or form, in any thing that the city spends money on. I think that 45000 should be left alone. Uh, I really think that in terms of city services, we always hear that police and fire are number one and two in the order of importance. I would put neighborhood councils number three. Um, in terms of the rollover, um, I would ask that um, you give it a one a one year sunset such that any expenditures say in the 09 10 fiscal year that we're in now would be able to be paid out by June 30th of 2011 and so forth each each fiscal year as until June 30th of the next fiscal year to pay it out um, in, in regarding the bank cards, you know, we have 84 good neighborhood councils versus six bad ones. I would ask that anybody that's been abused, any neighborhood council that's abused the bank card system, suspend that bank card system for, say, five years or some period of time. Don't penalize the neighborhood councils that depend on that card for uh, purchases that make sense using that card. Uh, again, I just want to reiterate, I think it's the biggest bang for the buck that the city gets, and I hope you maintain the funding. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Carol White, followed by Carrie. I, uh, Simo. From Reseda Neighborhood Council. All right, there you go. Uh, good That's afternoon. Right. I'm Carol White, and I'm the chairperson of the Voices of 90037 Neighborhood Council. I won't reiterate what so many of our colleagues and yourselves have uh, spoken to this afternoon, but I think maybe I can best... Uh, make the point that all neighborhood councils are not created equal. All of them do not function the same way. All of them do not have equal knowledge and experience. Uh, my neighborhood council was born out of the decertification of a previously certified neighborhood council. It was certified in 2002. The community realized that the people on the board and along with the leadership did not have the best interest of our community at hand. So we petitioned uh, the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners to decertify what was previously Vermont Harbor Neighborhood Council. That occurred, it took us three years for that to occur because no one wanted to take that negative uh, action on. And it took us three years and we were able to prove that there were various violations of the Brown Act. All that to say is that we as our communities can hold our own leadership in our neighborhood councils responsible. Uh, we should, and I do agree with the last speaker, is that if there are neighborhood councils that are not acting in the best interest, if they're not acting responsibly, if there's malfeasance and misfeasance, there should be some type of internal accounting and monitoring controls. As a matter of fact, what I have done for our neighborhood council is I have developed a database, which is a checks and balance system wherein it everyone in our neighborhood council can have access to all of our expenditures and it's backed up we don't get that online with done but I think that if we talk about reorganization I think with the input of those of us who are on the line uh, I think we can come up with a responsible viable neighbor council system thank you thank you forgive me sir could you state your name I couldn't read it's it Carrie but... Iacino Encino. Iocino. 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 Sorry. It's as difficult okay. to pronounce as yours the first time. No, it's right. just difficult to read. Without oh, right. <laughs> My arms aren't bad. long enough for me to read it. I apologize. So go Sorry ahead. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carrie Iocino. I'm the current chairman of the Reseda Neighborhood Council. Um, and I took over a few months back for our former chair uh, who resigned. Um, the fortunate thing for us is when I joined the Neighborhood Council two years ago, um, 
the neighborhood council is very unorganized and our former chairman took about two years to get the, the council running efficiently and working correctly and now that we're at that point uh, we're running into the problem of uh, funding um, not that we don't have funds available but the yearly rollover funds being frozen or in limbo has really caused us con concern um, our uh, our board has done quite a few good things, the most recent being uh, these neighborhood council uh, youth directories. Uh, we spent about a year, slightly over a year, compiling information for the youth of Reseda and our community, um, all the various things that youth can do to keep them out of trouble, and we distributed 23,000 of those uh, in our community. We've also recently held a, a first aid CPR training, an all-day training. Um, we had 70 participants. Um, who've all been certified by the Red Cross, and we have 84 or 85 more persons on a waiting list with 35 confirmed ready to go. Um, but once again, we're running into a funding issue. Um, as it stands right now, we've already spent $50,000 for the year. Uh, 27,000 of it has been uh, has already been demand warrants have already been paid. It's taken care of. 23,000 is in process. So our neighbor council now is stuck with the next few months trying to figure out what we're going to do if we're trying not to spend our rollover funds. So um, at this point, we're effectively in a slowdown where we're trying to decide what's going to happen. So the, the decisions you guys make, the sooner the better, and so that we can move forward and hopefully continue to serve our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Robert Gelfand, followed by Nina Royal. Thank you, Councilman. Um, I'm Robert Gelfand. I'm one of the founders, along with Doug Epperhart, of the Coastal San Pedro Neighborhood Council from back in the middle of 2001 going into 2002. Also one of the founders and current vice president of the Los Angeles Neighborhood Council Coalition, the link. Um, quickly, I think that the proposal that Doug gave you is a pretty good deal. You ought to think about it, I'm hoping, pretty seriously. Because if you look at the overall current cost of the system, it's about $11 million. And this is a proposal that would cut about $4 million out of that total cost. That's pretty good. That's about 35% cut. Uh, moreover, I'd like to point out that the uh, general manager of Dunn has actually been a witness to all these discussions and seems to be in understanding and agreement with the reorganization proposal. Um, and this proposal has also been endorsed by the, uh, the length, the LA Neighborhood Council Coalition. I uh, wanted to speak real briefly to one of the functions of the Neighborhood Council that doesn't come up very often, which is it seems to have become a, a kind of an arm of the LAPD. It's the buffer, if you will, the interface between your sen senior lead officers and the community. I don't think anything like this ever really existed before, and it's not something that I see in other communities uh, where I used to live, where you have, like, the sheriff's department. It's a complete wall. So uh, I support other uh, remarks that have been said by a number of other people, but please do understand uh, we are developing our own systems for training, teaching, showing people how to run meetings under the Brown Act and under Robert's rules and so on, and I think that we will take more and more of that. That's really what we want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Nina Royal, followed by Louis uh, Krokover. Sorry, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> He's not in. Good afternoon. My name is Nina Royal. I am presently serve as Vice President of Outreach for the Sunland Tunga Neighborhood Council and also serve on other organizations in my community. Uh, in my neighborhood council service, I have served as Treasurer, Secretary, Vice Chairman, Chairman, I, uh, Vice President, and so I kind of have a good idea of where the bones are buried and the improvements that are needed. I fully support the LA um, budget committee's recommendations. I believe you have a lot of talent in neighborhood councils. 
these people should be utilized. We can help Dunn. I think that we could work together with Dunn to come up with an excellent program. I know that you are talking about some other things like neighborhood councils not functioning and that type of thing, but I think that we could vet this all out. Give us a chance, utilize the uh, qualified people that are on these neighborhood councils, and I think that we could work together with Dunn to come up with a good cost-effective system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Royal. Uh, next is uh, Louis Crocover. Oh, it was pretty close. And uh, followed by uh, Sharon Cummins. Council members, staff, um, I'll keep this as brief as possible. You're basically asking for the neighborhood councils to assist in tightening their belt to make a budget feasible. And I'm all for that. I have no complaints with that whatsoever. Just don't take the belt from around our waist and put it around our neck and choke us to death. Because then we're going to be adversaries and not working together. Um, I support what this commission is trying to do and work this out. And I hope you'll come to an answer as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker is Sharon Cummins, followed by Leonard Schaefer. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Sharon Cummins, and I have the privilege of serving as first vice chair of Mar Vista Community Council. In the spring of 1979, my husband and I plunked down our hard-earned money on a little house in Mar Vista with a huge backyard. So after moving in, I popped my baby daughter in a stroller and took it down to our commercial corridor and promptly witnessed two drug dealers beating each other bloody over a deal gone bad. I later found out that our local bar actually was the site of an FBI ATF investigation and they were selling automatic weapons from behind the counter. <laughs> Not exactly family friendly. And I went home after witnessing that incident on the street and cried, what have I done spending all this money in this neighborhood. Well, let's go forward to 2010. One of the great things about being a community council volunteer is that you can help direct a little bit of money where it counts. On our commercial corridor, we have directed approximately $25,000 amongst tree trimming, streetscape improvements, open Mar Vista Wi-Fi, and alley cleanups. Really simple things, basic things. We have 14 businesses that have come into that two block area since 2006. We have four more coming online in 2010 and council members, they're not all medical marijuana pharmacies. <laughs> um, this is why I believe the CAO's proposals are inappropriate. I believe we should be allowed to retain our rollovers. I believe any cut we receive as community councils should be proportional to what the rest of the city is asked to sacrifice. As a Mar Vista stakeholder, as a past vice president of the Los Angeles Junior Chamber of Commerce, as an AYSO volunteer with Section 1, which goes the length of Southern California, and the mother of a national champion soccer player, who was a gleam in his father's eye when we bought that house, by the way, um, I support the Budget LA proposals. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Leonard Schaefer, followed by Mary Garcia. Good afternoon, Council uh, Chair, um, uh, committee, committee Chair, Mr. Corian, Council Member Zine. I'm Leonard Schaefer. I'm Chair of the Tarzana Neighborhood Council, Chair of the Los Angeles Neighborhood Council Coalition, and a member of the Neighborhood Council Review Commission. I've been involved in my community in this city as a volunteer for more years than I care to remember at this point particular time. I go back in the neighborhood council system to when they were holding seminars at USC at the Davidson Conference Center before the charter was passed. This, however, is a high point for me. As chair of the LANC, I, am I have been very pleased to see neighborhood councils coming together, not just uh, to claim their right to exist and be funded, but with solutions and suggestions on how to continue to accomplish our charter mandated roles. These are, are thoughtful suggestions. They have been developed over many hours at meetings, attended by numerous members of neighborhood councils. I fully believe that after careful consideration by the members of this committee, the positions that will be advocated by the neighborhood councils will form the basis for continued funding of the neighborhood council system that is both the neighborhood councils and done at a reasonable level while still helping to solve the current budget crisis. I ask that you listen carefully to those suggestions and solutions. 
thank you for having us here today. Thank you. The next speaker is Mary Garcia, followed by Diane Rosen. Good afternoon, gentle council people. Glad you're here. Gentle. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought I'd put that thought in your mind. Um, <clears throat> Um, I, I just want to say that I, I'm so honored and I feel so privileged to be part of this system that we have. If you look around, we have people here from all parts of this city, and I know most of them by name. That's extraordinary. Where in any city can you go as just a citizen and know so many people that we can talk to about the problems we're having and, and they may be having similar systems uh, problems and we can confer with each other to make things better. That's just one of the perks. Not to mention the millions of hours of, of time and energy that we spend. You couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't pay us to do what we do. You'd really go broke. So, uh, so right now you've got a pretty good thing going. I just say to you, to please listen to us. I support uh, the plan, the LA budget plan that we put together for you. If you do take the money away, you'll be taking it away from some very underprivileged people. Those are the people that we support in my community, the people that have perhaps an income of 12500 for a family of four. That's where my money goes. That's where my energy goes. So please reconsider or consider keeping our budget whole because they don't get anything from anyone but us. The next speaker will be Diane Rosen, followed by Damian Goodman. Good afternoon. I'm Diane Rosen, the chair of the Planning and Land Use Committee of the Encino Neighborhood Council. We do have a plan. Uh, one. neighborhood council funding be revamped, that the NC funding administration be transferred to a nonprofit entity such as the community partners, bank card system be revamped or replaced by alternative method of uh, providing petty cash, and the current 1.61 million rollover uh, stays until accurate, accurate accounting is provided. Uh, future rollovers be reduced from two years to one. Number two, the department be restructured. Dunn staff cut to about 15 and the department reorganized into uh, fundamental teams, functional teams. These teams need to work with the NC volunteers that are proficient in these areas. Three, NC elections. The city clerk should get out of the business of elections as soon as possible and repeal the ordinance. The cost of NC elections goes from 2.2 million, then it goes to 100,000. If you want the Los Santos stakeholders to have a meaningful voice in what is set out, like uh, as was set out in the beginning of the NC structure, then vote by mail. Vote by mail must be reinstated. Uh, finally, uh, the work of the neighborhood volunteers, uh, if it's leveraged, it's of great advantage and your city workforce will shrink. Thank you, Ms. Rosen. Uh, next is uh, next speaker is Damian Goodman, followed by Cindy Hench. Hen Henka? Hench. Hench. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, council members. Um, my name is Damian Goodman. I am the co-chair of the Empowerment Congress West Area Neighborhood Development Council. Uh, I am not going to be able to speak here in our official capacity, although. We've been here before. We don't like seeing cuts. Um, the good thing, council members, I think, is with every crisis is an opportunity for greatness. And many, and myself included, are, are deeply concerned about some of the proposals that have come from the CAO, such as the sweeping of funds. We're one of those councils that has more than one year's rollover and reductions in our, in our salary. 
But the bigger picture here is how we can get done to be a more efficient agency and we can deliver what we, what we best do as community organizers for the city. Um, I, I would be remiss to say I don't like having discussions about something so small. We're talking about $4 million out of a budget of $7 billion. I don't know who it is upon the staffs of the city that wants to ignite the 900 to 1,000, if not more, activists, the, the, the supreme activists within the city. But it doesn't make any sense. Four million out of seven billion dollars, you have to cut the pity in half 20 times. It's 0.05 percent of the city budget. So while we do discuss about restructuring done and, and making us better partners and greater efficiencies we can find in the system, I, I'd be very remiss to say that I, myself, would be at all interested in entertaining any reduction in funding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Governor. And, and for the record, we're looking at a lot of other things too, but this is just the one thing that I could pull into my committee. So, <laughs> uh, okay, uh, next speaker is uh, Cindy Hench, followed by uh, Clint Simmons. Hi, Cindy Hench from Westchester. I'm the president of the Neighbor Council of Westchester Playa, and I'm also the public safety chairperson. And I, you, first of all, I'd like to say that I support the recommendations that have been made by Budget LA. Um, but I'd like to tell you a little story about how this money grows and the kind of the, f the force multiplier of the money that is used by the neighborhood council, spent by the neighborhood councils. Um, I, with public safety as kind of my chief um, councilman sign, I got a story to tell you. Okay. <laughs> um, good. Um, with public safety being my main priority, I asked our neighborhood council for some money to spend on our fire stations. And I, I got the approval to spend some money on three of our fire stations. Well, I went out to our fire stations to find out what they need because they need a lot of stuff. I heard somebody said that they bought the jaws of life for their fire station. Wow. So I went and the guy said they all wanted exercise equipment and I knew that the little money I had wasn't really going to be go very far for exercise equipment. So I went to a gym in our area, the Spectrum, and I said, can you help me get connected with a vendor? She said, the controller said, I can do better than that. We're going to replace the equipment at two of our gyms and you can have all of it. So I ended up putting exercise equipment, commercial grade exercise equipment in seven fire stations. And that wouldn't have happened without a little bit of money from the neighborhood council. Now I did spend the money on a bunch of other stuff, including tools to, to repair the trucks and I mean really amazing stuff that these guys really needed that you would think that a city would provide, but we don't. So that's a story about neighborhood council money. Another thing that um, our neighborhood council has done again through the public safety effort is I organized the CERT training in our uh, community through our public safety committee and we've trained probably I guess it's like 400 people have gone through our CERT class and it's through those efforts of the volunteers of neighborhood council that great things like that are happening. Thank you. Next speaker is Clint Simmons followed by Bruce Horton. Good evening, Council Member. My name is Clint Simmons. I'm with the West Adam Neighborhood Council. One of the uh, things that I would like to see, the Neighborhood Council have been very beneficial, specifically in my community, where we have been able to bring science projects into the uh, uh, recreation centers that the kids don't get exposed to in schools and other places. And it has been an educational institution in that respect. Many times that the monies that I find that is being wasted by the city can be put into of programs like this. We have a problem with youth throughout the city of Los Angeles and the more things that we can get them involved with in school and after school will be very beneficial. And it is my belief and that of many parents in the area that we want to maintain the monies that's available, especially rollover money, should come back. This past year we was unable to uh, put in the program that we normally do as what we call our family day because we didn't have the funds. The kids are looking for we, the uh, Traveling Space Museum is one program that we use in the community. The kids get an opportunity to see what it's like in space. It has a space simulator, a space toilet, and uh, they feel like they're really in space in that respect. And many of them have uh, gone on and become very good students. Once they find out why math is being taught in school, they can see that you uh, use math to design antennas, to make spacecraft, 
to uh, send spacecraft into outer space. And these are the things that we want to keep going. And I want you and other members of the council to restore the rollover funds for the various councils so that we can continue to use them in a more active and proactive way to help keep our kids out of the uh, crime area. Thank you for allowing me to speak today and uh, take our thing into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next speaker is Bruce Horton, followed by Helene Maiden. Good afternoon, Councilman. I am uh, from Coastal San Pedro Neighborhood Council. I'll be short and sweet. I'm just here to support the proposal that we have made to you. I, I haven't seen any group in the city yet, maybe some of the unions that have given up stuff, that have worked harder than these neighborhood council people at trying to work with the city council in this budget crisis. Please let us be part of the program. Thank you. The next speaker is Helene. I <laughs> Thank you. For the record, she just said she uh, supports Budget LA's proposal. Um, the next speaker is Sue Devandry, followed by Agnes Lewis. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Sue Devandry. I am the outreach chairperson for Granada Hills North Neighborhood Council. Um, I know personally, for the last five years, I spent hundreds of hours in outreach, um, writing newsletters, putting out articles, um, trying to get the community involved in what neighborhood councils are and what we do and what we're here for. Um, I know that we couldn't, we do a lot of things for our community. The reason I do it is because I love my community. I am passionate about my community. I want my community to be the best it can be. And I think a lot of the, the people who are here, who are neighborhood um, council members, feel the same way about their community as well. Um, and I just want to ask you, please do not cut our budgets. Um, we really need that money to do the good that we have been doing so far. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Agnes Lewis. Followed by uh, Leon Marzillier. Marzillier. Agnes Lewis, a Granada Hills North Neighborhood Council board person. Um, I understand uh, the need for the city to save money. Uh, having uh, run $600 million budgets myself, I uh, know the need to make sure that expenses are kept in line. Part of the exercise, however, should be to make sure that cutting someplace doesn't inadvertently end up costing you more someplace else. Uh, as has been pointed out, uh, the neighborhood council budgets pay only for direct costs. There's a tremendous amount of volunteer labor that costs nothing in staffing costs. Um, much of the work that we do ends up saving the city, perhaps not visibly to you, but it does. For example, I work in the, uh, at the, the council on the uh, Planning and Land Use Committee. We end up uh, working with businesses to help them uh, organize in such a way to help them put in projects that meet what the neighborhood wants. For example, uh, we've worked with a lot of uh, communications companies on cell towers. We end up coming to agreements with them. Therefore, they don't take the city's time uh, and don't end up with lots of multiple appeals. Same things with developments in our area. We have been able to negotiate and come to agreements with developers such that they didn't end up having to go through multiple appeal processes with the city. By the time they go to the city, they know they have the neighborhood behind them because it's all been worked out. So you cut the funding in one place, you end up perhaps needing more staff to manage these kinds of things. On the um, uh, funding levels, you know, there's a certain minimum uh, beyond which we just can't uh, operate because of the requirements of the Brown Act and meeting places and so on. There's a certain amount of funding that's necessary. On the rollover funds, if you end up cutting them, you're penalizing those neighborhood councils that were efficient and thrifty and didn't spend all their money and saved it. So please consider that. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker is Leon Marzillier, followed by Kim Thompson. 
Good afternoon. My name is Leon Marzilia. I'm the uh, president of the board of directors of the Granada Hills North, North Neighborhood Council. Um, I am here to oppose the draconian cuts that have been proposed. Um, I, I'm actually in favor of no cuts, but uh, if, if there are to be cuts, I'm in favor of the budget LA proposal. And I'd just like to give you two examples from our neighborhood council that uh, could actually save the city money by keeping the funding of the neighborhood councils. One is that I got uh, <coughs> an email recently from the mayor's office saying that they want our help in the census. And, the, and one of the sentences in there said, they can't do it without us. Now, if, if, the, if the census doesn't count all our uh, population, you well know that that will cost the city money. So with the neighborhood council's help, you actually could be saving money in that respect. The other thing is our public safety committee has been very active in, in preparing for an earthquake. And everybody, every expert predicts there'll be an earthquake like Hades here sometime in the future. If that hits, we have a lot of, the, the neighborhood councils all around the city have a lot of people who are prepared to help, who are cert trained, will help the fire department and, and the police will not be sufficiently manned to be able to deal with all the problems and neighborhood councils can really help with that. So I really implore you not to do the draconian cuts. If there are any cuts, do the budget ally process. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next speaker is Kim Thompson, followed by Jason Buchalter. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Thompson and I'm from Granada Hills North Neighborhood Council. I have nothing more to add to the presentation that you were given today by Budget LA. Neighborhood council members and stakeholders are part of the city and we want to help you. We have valuable talent within the city family and it should be utilized to help you with the enormous budget crisis you are tasked with managing. I hope you believe in our value to you and allow us to help you recoup the millions of dollars of uncollected debt that's owed to the city. We are bringing money saving ideas to take, for you to take back to the city council. I think that you would be impressed with the amount of time, effort, and discussion that has been put into these suggestions that were written with a huge group of constituents from San Pedro to the Valley. This is what I imagined when I voted for the Charter in 1999 because of the idea of neighborhood councils before I knew what they would actually become. Because I've been involved for so many years, I know the incredible amount of money volunteers spend on gas and copying alone. The vast majority of us are responsible and have budgeted our money wisely and where we believe our communities need it. Without our rollover money, even our elections are difficult and some of our elections are next week. Please consider releasing our rollover funds and please consider the 5,000 cut that we graciously took last year as proof of of our desire to work with you. I disagree with those who would call Dunn inefficient and ineffective. I believe that Dunn has done a phenomenal job over the years considering their job description changes and they must update their skill sets every two years or so. I think that merging Dunn with the city clerk's office is a really bad idea. I would rather see the neighborhood councils take back the elections. That's another million we can save you there and we can do it more efficiently. Um, please breathe the hybrid. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Jason Buchalter, followed by Glenn Bailey. Afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Jason Buchalter. I'm a school teacher at Charnock Road Elementary School, Los Angeles Unified School District, located in the Palms neighborhood. And has there been graft corruption? fraud in the neighborhood council system? Yeah, apparently there has. But I'm just here to take a minute of your time to let you know the impact that the council's monies has had on the children and families in one small school in one small pocket of LA. Um, Charnock's a Title I school. I'm sure as you know any Title I school. We mainly educate the children of the maids bus boys and gardeners of West LA. You know, we're in the apartments right by the freeway. Um, we don't have a PTA really, we don't have a booster club, 
we can't raise money to offset the LAUSD budget cuts or for extra after school programs, libraries, all those sorts of things. But we feel these kids need these things. They're not extras. And we work very hard to raise money on our own. And the council's money, Palms Neighborhood Council and Mar Vista, have given us small grants, like $5,000. And then anytime you want foundation money, the first thing foundations ask you is you have matching funds. And so we're able to say, yes, sir, we do have matching funds. We have $5,000 from the Palms Neighborhood Council, and we're applying for this library grant. So we built a wonder of reading library for the children. We raised $30,000 from the $5,000 seed money from Palms. We built a reading garden from a $5,000 grant where I got a $10,000 foundation grant. Near city uh, beautification grant, wonderful program. We lost our art teacher last year. Takes ten, just $10,000 to hire her. So got $5,000 from the council, then went, then went to the parents and said, we need $5,000 more. You know, and these are people who don't give money, but they stepped up. We did what it takes. We put on a dance. We hired this magician donated time, etc. And we got, I mean, it makes a big difference, these small funds to these kids. So please help this program. Thank you, sir. Next speaker is Glenn Bailey, followed by uh, Chris Rowe. Rowe. Okay. Uh, Chris. Okay. Come back. Yes, there she is. Oh, okay. Chris, how fast can you run? Perfect timing. <laughs> Yeah, Take your time. We don't need any more. We don't need any personal injuries in the council chambers, please. She's in a full so. Hi, I'm Chris Fro. Um, since I live in Council Member Zine's district, it's easy to address things to you um, because you know what's happening there. And and I was thinking about it as I was walking back. What we do very much is invisible. For example, I was riding my bike in my neighborhood in West Hills uh, on Saturday, and there's a major tag next to the Milk and Jewish Community Center. So I came home, and as a neighborhood council member, I got on the phone and I called 311. Yesterday, I emailed you, and I emailed my slow. If I wasn't a neighborhood council member, I wouldn't know how to reach these people. I, I want to say that uh, when the Metrolink accident happened, Councilmember Zine was there, and so was Councilmember Alarcon. That accident was so bad that one didn't know the other one was there. But you know who was there, too? It was the Chatsworth Neighborhood Council, and it was their budget and their credit card that enabled them to go out and buy food and water for the people that were the victims and for the community members that were rushing to the train incident. So that's one reason right there why we need to have a credit card. And then I want to remind you that during these rains and the fires, Sunland Tahanga, and I'm sure there's other ones, have been out there working on behalf of their community, and they too have to help with the evacuation of the people. Um, I, I want to remind you of the posse that Council Member Zine has. So I want to tell you that the money, the rollover money, has been allocated. For example, we've allocated money to the Topanga Station. It hasn't been spent. We've allocated money to the West Valley Food Pantry, and that was a year ago. That money has not been uh, given to the food pantry. So I oppose uh, taking away rollover money. I, and, and I oppose... Um, Oh, one thing I do want to say is I went to Vank recently, and what they suggested is, is taking the money from uh, that's being uh, the, the control over the funding from Dunn for for the neighborhood councils and putting it under the city co controller's auspices. And if she can't handle that, then finding an independent agency that can handle that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Michael Coben, followed by Noel Weiss. Sorry for the delay. Um, good afternoon. Um, 
You know, there, there's been a lot of reduction in crime, and I can't help but feel, I can't prove it, of course, but with the growth of neighborhood councils and their influence, I, I, I have a feeling that there, there's some linkage there. There's some people in this that will discuss how crime has been reduced, how their neighborhood watches, and how they form coalitions to reduce um, gang violence. But I really want to address a couple of issues. I may be directing this to my own councilman a bit. Um, I've gone through the charter, and uh, frankly, there's very little mention of uh, funding for any of the city departments. The, uh, with the exception of the proprietaries and pension, library and parks and recs, they get a piece of the um, uh, property tax revenue. But it generally, it's left to uh, ordinance and, and, and practice and custom. Uh, but, but the important thing is the charter does lay out the duties of departments, including the urban councils. And, and we could have a vibrant argument about how much, <coughs> excuse me, how much it takes for these requirements to be met. But, uh, but the ordinances do provide some detail. We're talking about uh, how agencies must be provided with office space, staff, communication equipment, uh, as any department should be. To me, to talk of a 50 percent cut, it's egregious. You're saying that neighborhood councils make no difference in this city. What are the, what are the departments getting a 50 percent cut on top of a 10 percent cut that we've already taken? As far as NC spending habits, let me back up and say th this discussion we're having now is good. It's, it's very good. It's probably something that should have been done a couple of years ago. Uh, we're possibly doing it now more under the gun. I understand the, the problems that you have. You're, you're being pulled from many sides. And I agree that some of the spending habits of some of the neighborhood councils, where they spend their money, can be improved. But that's really of, of kind, not in, not in amounts. Um, you know, donations to community groups in hindsight might not have been such a great idea. What happens, I think, is that neighborhood councils then tend, instead of being proactive and going out for projects to do, they wait for people to come to them, nonprofits say, give me 500, give me 1,000, give me 2,000. That in itself is not bad, but I think, I think some of the fallout from that is. I would like to see seed money to be used by neighborhood councils to get projects going and to work in partnership. Uh, you know, I, I could go. You know, I could go on, but I think you, neighborhood. You'll have a report. chance in agenda specific items if you want to put another another. Card. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next speaker is. Talking. Yeah, yeah. The boy. <laughs> <laughs> we we <laughs> won't have any discussion about pots and kettles right now, Mr. Weiss. But yes, the next no, speaker is Noel Weiss, gotcha. followed by Rusty Millar. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, you know, I think this is really neat. Because now, for the, maybe for the first time since the neighborhood council system, we get to find out what our leaders are made of. Um, and I'm really looking forward. It's kind of like a little treasure hunt. Um, are you guys really up to it? Um, I think you are. We have no choice. Um, core beliefs, power of ideas, power of the people. Most importantly, I can guarantee you that if you went out there, you could come up with, because you, you guys talk a lot between yourselves within City Hall. You really don't get out. Dennis, you were part of the Charter Commission, Section 908 of the Charter. Take a look at it. You, you, you helped draft that. That section says that the City Council can appoint neighborhood councils to, to in effect, advise it formally. We should have a 908 commission, rotating members, seven neighborhood council members. Let them go out there. I guarantee you, you're going to come up with ideas, not just with neighborhood councils, as good as this, this uh, Dunn Hybrid is, which, by the way, I, wa I want to hand out. But more importantly, uh, I think we'll find ways to leverage the dollars. Will you be able to get more money? That 45 can be leveraged to probably three or four times, and there are specific examples of that all over the place. Um, more importantly, so the 908 Commission is something that, that this City Council should do. Number two, and, and, and this is really, I think, very important, Section 911. Again, Dennis was involved in the drafting of it. It says that no, that the appropriations for neighborhood council is supposed to be made one year in advance, one fiscal year in advance. Why? Because you don't want to be subject to political pressures. What if a council member or majority of the council doesn't like what the neighborhood council is doing? So boom, they're going to cut their funding. Well, you know what? Not right. I think what you're doing going forward, you need to think about 211 or what is it, 1011. But you, I don't think you can cut. And, and by the way, the mayor never in his comments did he ever refer to any consultation with neighborhood councils. More importantly, I don't think the mayor has the power to lay off anybody other than his general managers with limited, limited exception. And, and, you, and we need to challenge that. And there has to be a source of it. And Trutanich has to come out. He protected his own department. We've got to basically protect going forward. But I think this proposal, and I'm going to hand it out. If you haven't read it, uh, maybe we can put it in the, uh, you know, official uh, uh, part of the council file, but honestly, thank you. I appreciate it. We will it. do that. Thank you.
Next, next speaker is uh, Rusty Millar, or Miller, uh, followed by Jose Aguilar. Thank you. Uh, next speaker then is uh, Jose Aguilar, followed by uh, Rashad Rucker. Yeah, my name is Jose Aguilar. I'm a member of both Lincoln Heights and Boyle Heights Neighborhood Councils. And uh, I have a different viewpoint on what's going on here. I see this as an act of political retaliation for all the activities and for all the special interest groups that us as neighborhood councils in our advisory role have been working against. Uh, uh, Measure B comes to mind. I could, uh, SB 18 comes to mind. The billboard issue comes to mind. And all the small land use battles that we fight in our communities. Uh, the special interest would much rather have us go away and not deal with us and uh, wither on the vine by slashing our funding. Um, and I can tell you one thing, we're on to that game. Uh, and what you don't realize, what you're looking at, is that everybody here are members of Democratic clubs, members of Republican clubs, members of homeowner groups, uh, different political nonprofits, the, the whole gambit. So you're not just dealing with uh, you know, neighborhood council stakeholders, you're dealing with the political system of Los Angeles. And we all have kind of developed some camaraderie and we developed a way of working with each other and we've seen it pan out. Um, and Mr. Kokorian uh, have seen it happen. I mean, he was facing a $4 million campaign race and uh, the special interest flooded money like uh, there was no tomorrow. And it was us, the people, that gave him the upswing. And again, $74,000 versus $3 million would measure B. Again, it was the people coming together, working through our networking processes and neighborhood councils that gave us the upswing. So I want to let you know that we understand this is a political retaliatory strike against the people of Los Angeles. And it will be taken such and will be publicized as such. And uh, just keep that in mind. Thank you. Next speaker is Rashad Rucker, followed by Terry Owen Robinson. Mr. Rucker, welcome. Hi, how you doing? Uh, my name is Rashad Rucker. I'm with the West Adams Neighborhood Council. Um, this is a very great learning experience for me. A uh, young man is trying to get in um, that's very interested in politics. But I'd just like to encourage the council to just continue to work with the neighborhood councils and um, please just you know, listen to our ideas and definitely uh, continue to stand, be um, stand behind us um, as we all try to, you know, solve this issue of, of the, the budget crisis that we face. Uh, also, to uh, neighborhood council, uh, my neighborhood council, we've done a lot of great things in our community. Um, I won't go through it because Clint Simmons already went through it already. But uh, again, just want to encourage you guys to continue to just listen to us and uh, work work with us as you know we try to um, solve the issues here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Terry Ellen Robinson, followed by Lenora Gershman Pitts. Hey, good day, council members. Thank you for letting me speak. Can you hear me? Okay. Perfect. Yes, okay. I just would like to remind you the reason that the charter was passed and the neighborhood councils were voted in is because City Hall realized it could no longer adequately serve the millions of people that live in Los Angeles. And we have proven with the neighborhood councils that we are taking up the slack, that we know what needs to be done in our areas, whereas City Hall couldn't look at every area and know what was being done. We are the eyes and the ears, as I said last week. We also need it done to set up. I was the only one who was told I had to set up a council because I was running the neighborhood watch. Dunn helped me and I got volunteers and we set up a great neighborhood watch, which is the Palms Neighborhood Council, which you heard Jason Buchholder speak about. We also take our two elementary schools computer labs so that the elementary students can become computer savvy at an early age. And 
we want to support our people and help our education in our area. And we also ran our own election. I was in charge of running the election the first time. It was pretty easy. It was a little cumbersome because we're mostly a gated apartment community, but we managed to do it with the help of Dunn by mailing to the gated communities people so they could have their ballots and stuff and come out and vote. The city clerk, from what I can tell, is really not making it at all. It's just not a wise thing to do. It costs a lot of money, and it's absolutely, absolutely inadequate. I also would like to say I attended the Budget LA meeting, or LA Budget meeting. Sorry if I said it wrong. It was absolutely marvelous. They have a great, wonderful plan for budgeting for the neighborhood councils, and I suggest that we take it up as fast as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Lenora Gershman Pitts, followed by uh, the second call for Glenn Bailey. Hi, my name is Leonora Gershman Pitts. I'm the co-chair of the Atwater Village Neighborhood Council. Um, I've, uh, I'm a transplant to LA, and I think that one of the problems with the city of Los Angeles is that so many people come here and they have no investment in this city. They don't understand how the city works, and they sort of don't care that the city works or that it doesn't. And what, this, what the neighborhood councils do is they encourage all of these people who've come here from North Dakota or New York and want to make a life for themselves in this magnificent city, and we get them to understand how the city works, why it works, and what we can do to work together to make it better. This is a city of transplants. You've got to make people care about it, or the city is going to fall apart. And what you have in the neighborhood council system is thousands of people, including our volunteers. I work 20 to 30 hours a week for free for the city as co-chair of my neighborhood council, for free because I love it, because I love Atwater Village that much. And you've got, I mean, think of the hundreds of thousands of free, of hours of free labor that you are getting out of us for $4 million a year. Uh, I could list all of the ways that the Atwater Village Neighborhood Council has spent our funds. We've given uh, brush boxes and GPS systems to our firefighters. We started our farmer's market. We help our small businesses. We have... Uh, helped with the gang sweep in North Atwater. We bring um, lots and lots and lots of outreach and information to our households, which are 30% monolingual. Um, I think that we do really, really great work with the money that we're given. And I want to speak in support of uh, Budget LA's plan. And I ask you to please understand that we are here to help you. We love this city so much that we give up our time for free to help you. So help us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And is, uh, is Glenn Bailey here? Okay. Mr. Bailey has... Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that is uh, the end of our general comment uh, period. And um, before we proceed to item one, I, I just want to say that um, that was a tremendously positive and instructive uh, uh, period of general comment. And I do want to offer also another vehicle by which people can provide their input um, on the topic of uh, neighborhood council funding and reorganization of Dunn, and that is through uh, a blog uh, that uh, my office has set up, and the, uh, the address is cd2policy.wordpress.com. And so you're welcome to provide your comments uh, there, cd2policy.wordpress.com. Uh, so with that, uh, let's proceed to uh, agenda item number one. Item number one is a motion, Kerkorian. Han, Koretz, Zion, Alicon, Labange, Wezar, um, relative to directing the CAO to study with appropriate stakeholders the transfer of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment or the Neighborhood Council funding program. Uh, thank you very much. No, we're going to go ahead and, and do this from the podium because uh, we're in a little close proximity here. So if I could ask, first to ask the uh, CAO representative to uh, discuss uh, the proposal, and then uh, I'll ask for a representative from Dunn. And, um, let's, let's Good proceed. afternoon. Wilson Poon with the CAO's office. Um, <clears throat> a, few, uh, a few months ago, our office was tasked with looking at different ways to resolve this year's $200 million budget shortfall um, before you in this committee today. 
is the uh, concept papers we drafted regarding the uh, curtailments to the funding program and the possible transfer of uh, Dunn or the neighborhood council funding program to CDD or city clerk. Um, and, and for now, I'd like to ask you to restrict your comments to the reorganization of the funding program sure. because we'll come back to the, um, the issues of annual allocations and rollover funds later. Okay. Um, our recommendation is to form a working group to look at the transfer of the funding program or the department to uh, CDD or city clerk. Um, there's also many different benefits and disadvantages of doing this, um, which is why we'd like to form a working group to vet out all these issues to see whether or not it is a good idea, whether or not we can just leave it as it is. Um, I can give you some of the benefits that we've listed. Um, and one of the reasons why, what's one of the one of the main driving forces behind this concept paper was, I believe, ERIP. Um, you know, in the next couple of months, our city will be losing a significant amount of accountants, systems personnel, and personnel people as well. And the city will need to look at ways to restructure our organization and redeploy our resources so that we do not prevent any reduction in service levels. So. Done is it with no exception, they will be losing a lot of employees to ERIP, um, and they do have some employees who are on the, the layoff list as well. Um, we're looking at ways, with, with the benefits of moving a smaller department into a larger department, you do have um, more resources to share and to um, distribute, you have more expertise. There are potential cost savings involved if you're thinking about eliminating positions, but I personally, I can't see how CDD or city clerk could absorb the workload without additional resources. Um, there's also greater flexibility with, I think, larger departments to fill vacancies um, where they can reassign staff, whereas with, right now with Dunn, they have to go through the managed hiring process to fill any vacancies. And I think staff retention is also a big issue as well because with a larger department, there are more promotional opportunities. You don't have employees leaving to DWP or some other larger department. Um, and we also think that there could be better administration of the funding program because you have more um, employees with more expertise and more years of experience in accounting. So those, those are some of the benefits that we will look at as we form this working group. And um, some of the disadvantages are um, They'll definitely require a lot of significant time and resources to facilitate this type of transfer, and I think possibly um, decentralizing the funding program from the rest of um, done. There, there could be some issues with that as well, and these are all issues we'll look at. And what we're uh, recommending in this proposal is, is that the council instruct the CAO with all the stakeholders and with the partnership with the neighborhood councils to look at whether or not this would be in the best interest of the city. Have you made any assessment as to uh, how quickly a working group could be formed, uh, a new reorganization format considered uh, and implemented? And I guess just to cut to the quick, is it impossible or is it possible to achieve these sorts of changes in order to realize any savings in this current fiscal year? I, I don't see us realizing any savings this fiscal year, be, unless. Um, I mean, unless we eliminate some type of positions or we consolidate and we're able to eliminate positions that do overlapping work, such as a secretary or personnel or accountants. But um, in the timeline, I would, I would say maybe a year, six months, probably next budget year, next budget cycle. Okay. Mr. Zine. The uh, item calls for the transfer funding program. What experience does the clerk's office have with funding? And what experience does CDD have with funding? Well, the clerk, I believe, currently has about 10 positions. Holly Walcott with the Office of the City Clerk. The City Clerk has two different um, currently programs where we uh, disseminate funds. One is the Business Improvement District Program, and the other is the General City Purposes Fund, which is for the Council. 
So the bid districts and general purpose. General city purposes. General city that's there's about thirty two million dollars in bid assessments and currently each I think each council district is I'm trying to remember what each council district is getting on the council of public services, but that's where the bulk of the general city purpose. I have there ever been any audits done on the clerk's office and auditing those dollars? Yes, on to both. What did that, what did that show? What's that? I, what did that I, show? What about CDD? Do you know uh, what they what funding they've been involved with? Terry Sauer, CAO's office. One of the reasons we wanted to look at CDD is CDD does have experience in dealing with community-based organizations through the block grant program. Um, they do audit CBOs. There's the whole issue of having to con conform with the appropriate expenditure of federal funds or you run into the disallowed uh, cost issue. And we thought maybe there would be some economies of scale there because you have accountants or accounting staff that would be able to deal with and work with the neighborhood council in the same way that they have to work with the CBOs and then allow them to, um, <coughs> to maybe sort out some of the accounting problems that we've encountered to date um, and specifically I don't know I'd have to defer to the general manager of CDD. So it might be more appropriate to have it through CDD if it was going to be run through an agency versus the clerk's office? The it's clerk's it's office. possible. It's it, you know these are areas we were asked to look at a number of items and in terms of what possibilities were there these both organizations seem to be um, ones where there might be a possible fit Clearly, we would have to do additional work to determine if, you know, which one would work better and come back to you with recommendations. Was and the clerk's office, the, I'm sorry, the controller's office, was the control office reviewed, the city controller, I who issues a lot of checks? I, in part, the reason the controller, the controller is sort of the, has the audit responsibility and the, and they're part of the process. So if we put them in the position of also monitoring and running the funding program, you need that separation of audit responsibility. And so it didn't seem as good a fit as either CDD or the clerk. So in your opinion, who's best prepared to handle something to this magnitude with 90, which could grow to a larger numbers? At this point, we would like to study the issue further. I don't want to go on record. So you're not as, sure? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to pick a child at this point. All right. We're all stepchildren somewhere, right? <laughs> If we can hear from Mr. Benbow. Richard Benbow, General Manager of the Community Development Department. Just wanted to point out two distinctions in the functions that we serve versus what's being recommended here. First of all, um, almost 100% of our money is uh, federal money, and we have no general fund money, and we do not administer programs on a citywide basis. We focus most of our programs and activities in areas of, of need. Uh, in terms of poverty and uh, and those types of programs, so uh, that is a little bit different than than. Uh, so the money that comes in to the by the federal government, you provide to a variety of organizations. That's right. Do you do audits? Do does the does the federal government do audits? Who audits to make sure that? Well, we 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 audit the organizations that uh, we that receive disperse the money to, and we're also audited by by the feds. Okay. Now, would this? be uh, much different than what you're doing now? It, it would be somewhat different in that all of our systems are designed to meet federal rules and regs and to meet all the requirements that we're obligated to uh, comply with under under those uh, federally and uh, federal entitlement programs. Uh, as I said, we have no citywide programs that are done with uh, general fund dollars, so we would have to retool in order to be able to meet the uh, requirements under, and you can uh, handle this with existing per handle this with existing personnel. Uh, I don't believe that we have the uh, level of staffing and resources available to administer a citywide program. Okay, this, so that'd be quite a size. review to make sure that it would work either way, either with your department or with the clerk's office. Okay, thank you. If we could hear from our city clerk, Ms. Lagme, if you can uh, provide your comments, please, about the CAO's recommendation. Very briefly, on the question of taking uh, 
accounting function of the Neighborhood Council Grant Program. This is not an idea that the City Clerk initiated, but if it were the will of this committee and the Council that the Neighborhood Council Grant Program be transferred to the Clerk's Office, we would not have an objection as long as we were provided adequate staff to, uh, to administer it. Uh, no fewer than four staff and uh, we would probably also need to talk about either adding an audit position or um, permission to go for an audit contract. But I just wanted to uh, make that statement for, for, for the committee for your consideration. Okay, thank you. Do you have yes, questions for the question? Okay. Um, if we could, thank you. If we could hear from Mr. Kim, please, on behalf of, uh, of Dunn now. Bung Lin Kim, General Manager, Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for allowing all the neighborhood councils to come and talk about the uh, importance of the neighborhood council system and the funding program. I think um, a lot of these people took time off of their work and um, for you to spend the time to allow them to air their concerns and issues um, I think is very much appreciated. Um, there are a few thoughts or uh, um, feedback that I had to provide uh, in terms of the recommendations. Um, my recommendation to the council would be um, whether or not you choose to maintain the department as an independent entity or merge it under a, a larger department is to understand that the neighborhood council system is a unique animal in city government. Um, it works both inside government and also works outside of government. And um, and there are uh, functions that the department um, has honed over the years to develop a culture that fosters as much neighborhood democracy as possible, and there isn't any department that can do that. The risk that you run by merging it under another department is to um, weaken the key functions that neighborhood councils need. Um, the next round of elections can result in as many as 50% of new board members coming online. Unless we're right there providing them the kind of education that they need to prevent a lot of the problems that we've seen over the years, Councilman Zion talks about uh, some of the infighting that happens. A lot of that is due to the fact that they don't have enough access to even flows of information in terms of what it takes to be a, a neighborhood council board member. Um, the, the city needs a champion for the neighborhood council system. Um, serving as the general manager, it sends a signal both to the neighborhood councils as well as to elected officials and city departments that there is a go-to person in the city when it rego regarding the neighborhood councils. Um, I've been the fifth GM in less than 10 years for this department. And the system has um, felt the impact of different leadership coming in and putting their own spin on what neighborhood democracy is. And I think the consistency as I've come into it, I realize that inconsistent leadership has been one of the plaguing problems for the neighborhood councils. The funding program is one major example of it. Um, to use a metaphor, when the neighborhood council system first started, the city needed a bus. But instead we got a car. Now with the budget crisis, it seems like we're going to be given a motorcycle. Harley Davidson. But instead of a Harley Davidson, Councilman Zine, which I know you have a strong preference for, I need a sport bike. I need a turbocharged sport bike that can take turns at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> if I'm given 10 staff, if I'm given 18 staff, we need to focus, be able to focus on the key functions that are going to lead to a stronger neighborhood democracy infrastructure in the city. Some of the um, act activists from the neighborhood council you heard from talked about four priorities. Well, I had laid that in a, in a plan to them a few weeks ago, which was a result of a survey that I conducted about August and September. Asked them, what are the services that you need mostly from the department? And they identified education and training as number one. Number two, outreach, marketing, and communications. Number three, <clears throat> helping to facilitate 
partnerships between city government and neighborhood councils. One example are discussions that we've been having with the Emergency Management Department and the Los Angeles Fire Department where they recognize the potential of having a citywide community-based disaster preparedness and response program. You've talked to a couple of neighbor, a couple of neighbor councils here have talked to you about hundreds of CERT trainees that would not have been trained otherwise. I suggest to you that that is one example of a strong partnership that will really weave the quilt between city government and neighborhoods that really you're talking about literally saving lives. Um, the funding program has been um, a broken system since its inception. And I've talked to, I've repeated this to neighborhood councils all the time that it really was not designed from the front end to be the kind of system that the, both city government needs and neighborhood councils needed. You need something that's easy to use by volunteers, often where treasurers have turnover on a regular basis. On the city side, you need something that's going to be bulletproof for the controller and for elected officials. So um, as a result of the audit, controller's audit, where I really wanted a public process to show where are the major weaknesses. And um, I own many of the problems that we have been able, unable to implement in terms of the controller's audit findings in 2006 and the most recent one. But I would suggest to you that we pursue a couple of paths. One would be to uh, keep the function within the department, whether it's uh, submerged under another department or um, kept independent, because the funding program um, is used in concert with our other services, because when there are inappropriate things that are being done with funding, it can usually be led to organizational development issues that neighborhood councils are having, and that is also tied to the lack of effective training for board members. So rather than as a separate function, I see it as something that is used as a tool to help communities empower themselves. And if you separate those two functions, I think that the synergy that's realized from having those two services offered together um, are lost. The, uh, there are some immediate changes uh, that I've implemented as a result of the audit findings. <coughs> and um, a couple of them are to eliminate the petty cash program. Um, rather than as a punitive measure, it really was a matter of staff workload. Um, as a result of the recent uh, transfers, we just lost two funding staff. So our ability to keep up with the payments um, is going to be even further challenged. And um, we are also, we have, I've also implemented a one credit card policy where we are asking neighborhood councils to turn in. Uh, there are about 40 neighborhood councils with more than one um, credit card. Separation of duties is something that uh, we will be announcing shortly, but the fact that the treasurer should only be responsible for bookkeeping functions. Somebody else needs to be responsible for actually paying the expenses. And then thirdly, the board needs to be approving financials on a regular basis. So whether that be monthly, I would suggest minimally every other month that the board be required to review the financial statements and take board action to approve their financials and those board minutes are submitted to our department. If they fail to do so, then we will freeze their funds. Those are some examples of, um, of uh, the actions that I've taken in the short term. You know, as we also look at the evolution of the neighborhood council system, I think it's also important for you to understand that in a lot of ways, neighborhood councils, because they're considered quasi-legislative entities by the city attorney, we have in essence become city government for neighborhood councils. So we are general services for the neighborhood councils. We take care of procurement, temporary staffing, goods and services. There are about 40 neighborhood councils that have office uh, leases. We have helped them with printing services. We're ITA. We help them post meeting agendas. Um, our website is looked to as a source of uh, information for um, neighborhood councils. Um, last I looked, our, our website had uh, 2 million hits in the last year. We're, we also administer contracts for neighborhood councils. They're not allowed to do their own contracts. So um, anything that involves uh, services uh, that involves a legal agreement, we have to administer that for them. 
We're the Ethics Commission. We, <clears throat> neighborhood councils, as you know, are required to uh, have an ethics test every two years. We have to monitor compliance. We have a database that reflects how many have completed, how many haven't. With the leadership of our commission, um, we've raised that the numbers from 100, less than 150 over the past year up to half. That's a major accomplishment, but again, that's the leadership of the department to recognize that that's an important issue for the advancement of the neighborhood council system, and so we're able to do something about moving those numbers. We're also a marketing and communications function for the neighborhood councils, so we help them with a liaison with Channel 35 media services. We uh, collect best practices and we tell the many untold stories that you heard this afternoon about what, what the difference neighborhood councils are um, making in their neighborhoods. We're also in the system building work. <clears throat> so we take on the work of the CLA because um, neighborhood councils need their own set of policies and procedures. For example, uh, we have a work group that's been charged with identifying <clears throat> ways to get more consistency across 90 neighborhood councils with their bylaws, which is essentially their self-constitution mechanism. And prior to this, uh, currently, we have 89 completely different sets of bylaws. That doesn't make sense for a citywide system that's going to be sustainable for the future. We also need to look at policies around a grievance system, um, outreach. What kind of training should neighborhood councils be provided? Lastly, we're a safety net for struggling neighborhood councils. So you, you, talk, you heard about neighborhood councils being decertified. We come in and provide assistance to neighborhood councils where they are struggling to meet their community mandate, provide them with technical assistance, but in the end, if they're unable to um, work out their differences and focus on community service, then we, there's a process by which we provide a report and make recommendations to our commission to ultimately decertify neighborhood councils. And we work also with the commission to pass policies um, that are forward-looking. So that, that's a brief summary of my comments in terms of the CAO recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Now, about uh, five years or so ago, uh, there was some study or analysis made about the possibility of uh, transferring the um, funding program to an outside uh, manager, a nonprofit or some other outside uh, source. What, um, what was found at that time? What was determined? What action was taken? And have uh, has anyone in Dunn uh, reconsidered that proposal and the findings that were made at that time? Um, I wasn't here at the time, but Claudia Dunn, assistant general manager, was, and she had a few preliminary meetings with a nonprofit organization to um, take over the well. In that in that case, to start up the funding program, but I think there were some uh, legal issues. Um, that was raised by the city attorney by having a non-city entity administer public funds. That may be an issue that we want to um, ask the city attorney for their advice um, as we consider this issue. Um, from an efficiency point of view and an expense point of view, I think a nonprofit would probably be able to do it better um, than city government. If the legal issues um, are not a barrier, um, I could order uh, or direct the staff to do an RFP process where we look at what are the options that certain nonprofits might be able to provide um, and can they do it more efficiently. Can we also have an arrangement with the controller such that they are their ability to approve payments and authorizations and auditing functions by a non-city entity? Those are some issues. Um, there as well, but I think a lot of neighborhood councils have been uh, pushing for this nonprofit idea, but there are a few hurdles there in, in terms of clarifying what the possibilities are. But if we were to move forward with the idea of the study group as proposed by the CAO, certainly that could be one of the areas that would be investigated by the study group as Correct. well to see if there were cost effectiveness in, in doing that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mr. Zine? Questions for Mr. Kim? I just know that from my experience, the audit was limited to the number of neighborhood councils. And I was reflecting on Rampart Division. What one division did to the image of the Los Angeles Police Department by a couple of officers that did something wrong. MacArthur Park, 
what image that did the Los Angeles Police Department. And it's the same thing with neighborhood councils, whether there's 90 or 9. It only takes a few to create this environment. So I just want to make sure there's safeguards, whether it's a nonprofit or it's through the CDD or the clerk or whatever the department it is, while 99% of them are going to be honest, there's going to be that 1% that's going to take advantage of it. And I just want to make sure for the taxpayers that those funds are appropriately dispersed for legitimate purposes. And as we've heard from the neighborhood council representatives, some want beautification for the community, some want to fund the schools, whatever the case may be, as long as it's done in a legal fashion. And the board, I know coming from the Police Protective League, I was a treasurer, and those treasury reports would be approved by the entire board at the board meeting. And I think there has to be a process where neighborhood councils, while there's a treasurer, the board has to approve so everyone is knowledgeable. So if someone asks a question, it creates that environment. I think it, as you said, it was, it's been run too sloppy uh, for a long period of time. And I would cringe to think what would happen if they audited all of them and see what other problems occurred out there. Maybe we've cleared it up, but I want to make sure there's safeguards. And that's my big concern, that we have safeguards to make sure it's done properly. And however it's done, as long as it's done properly. That's my big concern on it. Well, and it's, it seems cl very clear to me that um, the function has not served the purpose of providing enough accountability for the city. And it also has failed to provide the function of ease of use uh, and convenience and efficiency for the neighborhood councils. So I, I do agree with many of the speakers who identified this as an opportunity for us to fix a system that by all accounts, both from the the payor and the payee uh, side of it, uh, has been broken and uh, really needs to operate in a much more effective uh, way. So um, I hope that that will be um, the result of what we do and what the council does as well. Um, thank you, Mr. Kim. I'd like to ask, uh, uh, I see Mr. Abram and uh, Ms. Luck, if you'd like to come up on behalf of uh, Bonk and uh, discuss your thoughts uh, briefly about this portion of the CAO's recommendation. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Happy to be here. It was just delightful to hear the reports from all the neighborhood councils from around the city. Thank you all for coming. You can see the great work that we do. Um, my name is Linda Lux, and I serve as the, a member and past president of the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners. I'm also the vice president of the Venice Neighborhood Council. And one of the gifts that we as commissioners uh, get, the best thing that we do, is travel around the city. Unlike other commissions, uh, we travel around the city every month and we listen to all the neighborhood councils and we hear firsthand about the great work that, we, that they do. We also hear about the problems. But the achievements that they, that they uh, reach are inspiring and they make it crystal clear to us that um, the annual funds allocated by, to the neighborhood councils add such incalculable value to the city, what they provide to the city, um, and services that the city couldn't do otherwise. I mean, you heard that today. I don't have to repeat it. We do serve as the eyes and the ears for the city. We work with the police department. We work with you. Um, there's nobody else that builds community the way that, that we do. Um, I was going to share with you some of the stellar achievements, but you heard them all today. Uh, yeah, and if, in the interest <laughs> so of time, I will not repeat, the, but there are, there are many. On this part of the recommendation okay. dealing with the funding and program. In terms of um, the transfer of the, of the um, funding program, obviously it's been a problem. I personally, and we haven't taken a position as a board on this, but would like to see a nonprofit um, monitor it and, and under the department. Uh, auspices, because I think there's been enough mistrust and enough problems. There needs to be some uh, other entity that manages it uh, that's objective. So that would be my personal uh, recommendation without having brought this up at the board and the board level. So, so Commissioner. Good afternoon. Thank you, um, Councilman Gregorian, Councilman Zion. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, with regard to um, number one on the agenda, the, uh, the importance that Council Zion has put on safeguarding the people's money is number one. It's primary. Full transparency across the boards is primary. The ability for neighborhood councils to easily do their transactions, not have to worry about it, not have to lose sleep about it, and to know that their vendors are going to be paid on time is also primary. The neighborhood councils are, in a sense, 
an extension of this city at the grassroots level. Where are the people that they call when they need help? And we're happy to provide that. When there are transactions to hundreds of vendors, that's also the city, in a sense, reaching out and conducting business with them. With regard to the specifics of whether or not it should go to a nonprofit, whether or not it should be transferred to this, another city department, really what we're looking at is what is legal, what is easy to do, what will create the, that ease that we talked about and that transparency along the way, because this is the muscle of neighborhood councils. This is where the rubber meets the road. The, the commission as itself has not taken a stand of whether or not it should go to a community partners or to another uh, nonprofit to do, or if it should go to city clerk. Um, and we certainly, on March 2nd at our next commission hearing, we can certainly have that on the agenda to get the, uh, the vote and the wisdom of the commission with regard to these uh, different alternatives. Um, personally, I have no problem going to letting the city clerk do it or CDD do it, as long as the personality and the vigor and the characteristics of the neighborhood council system is not changed with that process. If it's strictly uh, an ability to move that function, I think that's fine. The, the city's commissions have varying degrees of uh, managerial responsibility, and Bonk is not known as a managerial uh, commission. If you By law. If, well, um, okay, but that's that's what we do. Uh, if if there were um, a change in that, so that uh, Bonk had sufficient staffing and the legal authority to do so, uh, what would be your view about uh, transferring the the funding program to to Bonk? Uh, as a commission, I'll speak briefly, and then I'll let uh, Commissioner Lux speak to it. Um, currently, now. As you know, we are not allowed to get involved in the managerial day-to-day -day operation of the department. There was a wall put up by the charter. For what reason, I don't know, because I believe a lot of the other commissions that do get involved and bring wisdom and common sense to departments work a lot better. Uh, we don't have the staffing right now to do that. Uh, that could change. We could work hand-in-hand -hand with the city department to uh, help with that. Um, providing the commission more management potential, I think, could be a very good idea, personally. Yes, I agree. It has often been frustrating as commissioners not to be able to have any sort of managerial control, although we have, I think it's a pretty strong commission and we have, we've wanted that. We even had to ask for city attorney opinion because many of us, when we first came on, believed that we had that and were told in no uncertain terms that we didn't. So I think that um, without having had this full discussion with the commission, I, I would sense that the commission would definitely be in favor of accepting that more responsibility. Thank you. Mr. Zine? I, I just have one follow-up question on funding. Uh, just 90 neighborhood councils. If 90 neighborhood councils separately purchase these, because I like to shop at Costco and I shop bulk, is there any coordinated effort, we're talking about funding, where 90 neighborhood councils could get something like this done for a cheaper price? Has that been done with the, the through the commission or through the neighborhood councils, where they can buy in bulk instead of 90 separate orders which you're going to pay a lot more for versus one on a, regarding on a, the yes, falls on into a, funding. On a region by region basis, there have been neighbor councils who have collaborated on such things. Um, uh, when it comes to the Congress of Neighborhood the Congress of Neighbors every year, yes, that's done. Um, but no formal um, procedure to do that, but that would be an excellent thing. Because we could stretch those dollars out of funding. Absolutely. I know the management is one issue, but I just wanted to yes. highlight that part. Okay, thank you. Save money. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, uh, we're going to hear uh, public comment now on this item, uh, but I do also want to remind everyone, too, uh, that you can also provide uh, public comment directly through our blog at cd2policy.wordpress.com. Uh, so the first speaker on item number one, and we'll have uh, one minute per speaker uh, on the specific items, uh, will be Noah Weiss, uh, followed by Mike Newhouse. Okay, well, I feel like uh, we're all a bunch of Moseses here saying, set us free. 
um, this, th th this discussion, let my people go. This discussion about every time something comes up, it has to be bu the bureauc bureaucratic mentality, respectfully, has to stop. Um, this idea of studying this, studying that, it's time for action. We're talking about empowering individuals, um, not and, and by the way, the, the, again, Mr. Zine, I, because he helped draft this, the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment is a charter agency. You can't merge it into another agency. It's part of the charter people. Um, with regard to um, the uh, openness and transparency, your, your, your control over dollars, that's not your concern. That's not a problem. You basically put it all on the Internet. That's what the federal government is starting to do. Every transaction, every ledger, believe me, there are enough people out here that will find uh, whatever it is that you're concerned about happening. So long as you maintain openness and transparency, I don't think you're going to have a problem in terms of basically finding out where those dollars are. With regard to... All right, I'm done. That was good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Mike... <laughs> Good, he's done. <laughs> Mike Newhouse, followed by uh, D.D. Audet. Mr. Newhouse? Is Mr. Newhouse here? All right. Uh, then we'll go to D.D. Audet, yes. followed by Stephen Knight. Mike Newhouse was president of the, uh, I, I think he had to leave. I've come here as representing myself. Uh, do you have this item here that I, good, good. Um, if I buy a sack of Fritos, the delivery system knows, the warehouse knows, the stock clerk knows, and some marketer in maybe a skyscraper in New York or a ranch house in Montana knows how many, what kind, the design, when and where I got it. Now, unless all departments use the same accounting methods, Of course you're going to have duplication. You have to have standard nomenclature. To bring stakeholders in, which you should, you need to establish standard nomenclature and standard accounting methods. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Stephen Knight, followed by Jose Aguilar. I realize now my comments should have gone under the general, general objections. I would ask that you excuse me, the confusion is mine. There are some members on the city council that have no use for neighborhood councils. One way of getting rid of them is to cut off their funding. Others have learned their value and to work with the neighborhood councils to save them time and effort. Now the city council is, is protected by guards and physical barriers, such as you are. Neighborhood council board members don't have any such luxury. Our constituents even have our home phone numbers. They do call. We share... <coughs> constituents of the City Council, by the way. We understand the need for certain programs and policies that the average citizen doesn't. We understand that there will be growth in Los Angeles, even in these tough times. I don't know how many times I've had to explain why my Planning and Land Use Committee has okayed a 350-unit development that was originally presented as a buy right development. The Council doesn't have time to explain to all your consistence. consistence. At one at one time or each and every action, you cannot explain those. So we ask that you do not cut us off. Please give us our funding that we so richly deserve. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next piece, speaker is Jose Aguilar, followed by Catherine Walker. Hi, my name is uh, Jose Aguilar. I'm a member of both uh, Lincoln Heights and Ball Heights River Council. Again, we are uh, a product of the uh, city charter. I would expect you to abide by that. I hope you understand the history of the city charter, the way that we went through secession, and this was the outcome of that secession movement, is the development of neighbor councils. I also would like for you to consider that these uh, slush funds, these five slush funds that, that city council has in protecting, I would love to have some of that money used to fund our department. I don't see no reason why. We're going to do an expose in the Voice publication concerning how Weezer has used the Clark's Fund throughout the city. Uh, Carmelillo uh, Golf Course in Malibu. All the different patronages and how that money is being used and not being used to uh, actually fund our activities here. There's a lot of money that could be allocated. There's $2 million that was sent to Warahata Book Fair. I mean, I could go on and on. There's, there's hundreds of examples. And what blows my mind is that we're only talking about $3 million, and yet we're the targeted ones. We're the ones that need to be slashed. So I oppose the uh, 
uh, the slashing Thank of our you. budget. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar. And, and as a reminder to the public, we're now on specific agenda items. So in this portion of public comment, please restrict your comments to the agenda item at issue, which is tra potentially transferring the funding program uh, to different agencies within the city. Uh, the next speaker is Catherine Walker, followed by Stephen Box, who is my final speaker on this agenda item. Uh, well, I guess not. Uh, Ms. Walker? Not here. Stephen Box. See, uh, Stephen, you're here. Sorry. On this item and the four that follow, the keyword is potential. We have the opportunity to work together. It's not something we can resolve today. But at this late hour, I think there are a lot of people that agree. With regards to potential, we just want to make sure we're at the table and that we're doing this as partners in making this a great city and finding great solutions to the problems that lay ahead. If that's what we're talking about, we don't have much more to say. And we want to ask you to embrace us as your partners in this endeavor. It's an ongoing endeavor, but it starts now, this journey. And that's what we're asking, is that we can be a part of this process. Because we're hearing from folks we haven't spoken to that are speaking on our behalf. And we would like to make sure that that changes now and that we are all communicating and working together towards a solution. So that's my comment specifically on the potential for funding and the other opportunities that lay ahead, but that we start now as partners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Leonard Schaefer, followed by Doug Epperhart. Again, commissioners, welcome. Um, Councilman. Excuse me, I said commissioners, council members. It's been a very long day, Mr. Zine, very long day. It's 8 o'clock this morning. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, with regards to funding, um, I would say personally I'm very much in favor to see this move to someplace outside of the city. Uh, we at Tarzan are very fortunate to have a very excellent uh, person handling our funds. Uh, a former CFO and he's looked at things he's tried to recommend things the problem is that the city is just not prepared really for organizations like neighborhood councils sometimes we need guidance sometimes we need freedom an outside agency that is used to dealing with these type of organizations would be much better suited to this and I think that is something that you should really really look at on top of which I would predict that it would actually save the city money because it all could be part of the funding system for neighborhood councils. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Doug Epperhart, followed by uh, Catherine Walker again if she's returned. Okay. A couple of things. Um, the way to prevent people in neighborhood councils from stealing money is to create a rule that they have to audit themselves. Okay, this is something we have talked about in the bylaws uh, working group and which I have urged upon done. The easiest way to determine this is to get treasurer's reports from every neighborhood council every month. Nobody's ever bothered to do that, okay, even though some of us have suggested it. With regard to transferring functions of done to other departments, I can tell you we want the city clerk out of the elections business now. We certainly don't want to give them anything else. Because the city clerk, the CDD are going to want positions, they're going to want more money, and they're going to want more to do, um, and more to spend, and probably less to do. Uh, I, too, support an outside nonprofit taking over the funding. I think that's a better way to go. I think it's a cheaper way to go, and it becomes somebody else's aggravation. Thank you, sir. Has Catherine Walker returned yet? All right, then we'll go to Cindy Hench. Hi, thank you. Um, just a couple quick thoughts. As I listen to these folks talk about transferring this to this function of done over to the city clerk's office, what I heard was the city clerk agreeing to take on the grant program. That's different than the funding program. The grant program represents a small percentage of the number of demand warrants that the department processes. And I would suspect that, I mean, maybe it was just the misuse of words, but just beware of that. Um, the other thing is, I think that we're talking about, BH, is it three people who are doing the funding and 
process, four people in the department who service the funding process. I think we've probably spent more money talking about it than if we got rid of those four people. So I don't, I don't, I don't think you're talking about big money here. Thank you. Uh, is Catherine Walker returned? All right. And then I have a card from Cindy Cleghorn, but I don't see Cindy either. She left? Okay. All right. Uh, if there's nothing else then on item one, um, that brings us. Okay. Um, well, uh, clearly, I think we've, we've heard a, a, a wide range of, of views. I think that one of the points of agreement seems to be that this function uh, badly needs to be repaired uh, for, for, a, for a variety of, of reasons, both for the um, purpose of accountability and also for the purpose of cost efficiency and uh, utility to the neighborhood councils. Um, so uh, I, I'd like to recommend that uh, the CAO work with the city attorney, the CLA, done and in consultation with Bonk uh, and solicit the input of the neighborhood councils uh, to report and, and then report uh, back to this committee uh, within two weeks on the recommendations of uh, the feasibility of a nonprofit taking over the funding program and potential cost savings, uh, the feasibility of making Bonk uh, managing commission and moving uh, Dunn staff under that commission, uh, and the feasibility of having the city clerk, CDD, or other city agency uh, manage the funding program and uh, the cost savings associated with with such a transfer. And without objection, that will be the recommendation of this committee. Thank you, Mr. Zine. That brings us then to item two. Item two is a motion, Kikorian, Hahn, Koretz, Zine, Alicon, Labonge, Wezar, relative to the consideration of eliminating the neighborhood council rollover policy and transferring all suspended rollover funds totaling $1.6 to the reserve fund. Did you get that recommendation? Well, comments are kind of out of order. If you have a quick question. Very quick. I don't think two weeks is adequate to get to all of the neighborhood councils. It's going to take a little longer than that. Well, um, Right. I, I don't think there's going to be individual consultation with each of the 90 neighborhood councils, but we do have, we have to get moving. With cities in crisis, we have to move forward. We have to study this. Neighborhood councils can provide their comments through Dunn, through Bonk, through my office, um, and we're going to move forward on that. So, thank you. Uh, okay. Um, item number two we've called uh, this uh, is the issue of the rollover policy and uh, uh, why don't we uh, talk about the CAO's recommendation for starters and then we'll go from there sir um, item two is a recommendation to suspend the rollover policy um, as of June 30th 2009 there was about 1.6 million dollars in the fund uh, my understanding is Dunn has suspended that money until they have determined what the true roller balances are of each of the 989 neighborhood councils. So the money is still available, and we are recommending that we transfer this to the reserve fund or possibly the unappropriated balance. Um, there has been some discussions um, of honoring those neighborhood councils who have um, set aside money for large-scale projects or projects that they've been accumulating funds for. And may I suggest that if that is the case and if the council or the committee would like to honor those projects, we could move the money to the unappropriate balance and have done work with the neighborhood councils, have the neighborhood councils provide documentation, some kind of a board action or maybe through their annual budgets that demonstrate that this money has been dedicated to some larger purpose. And in the mid -year, in the year end report or possibly, you know, we can transfer those funds from the unappropriate balance to those neighborhood councils. So. All right. Thank you. Mr. 
Kim, do you want to um, come up and talk briefly about the status of the uh, rollover funds, uh, in particular how, uh, how we've accounted for them? Um, well, to give you a brief history of the um, rollover balance issue, and it's highlighted in a memo that we submitted to the committee in terms of the uh, different interpretations and applications of the rollover policy. So um, a few of the issues that arose were moving from a calendar year to a fiscal year back in 05, 06. There were um, also different interpretations of what the maximum allowable uh, cap was. Um, some in the city thought that they should be allowed to have 150 or versus 100 at the end of any fiscal year. So a um, year and a half ago, we convened all of the uh, departments and neighborhood councils and clarified that. But the biggest issue is the fact that our, sis our accounting systems did not have a way of coming to a complete accurate um, accounting figure at the end of every fiscal year. And we did also not have a system that, that confirmed that with each neighborhood council. So neighborhood councils submitted the process that we have had over the years is for neighborhood councils to submit a budget to our department, which included their, uh, their figure for the rollover plus the new allocation. And we did not, because we did not keep, not keep our accounting figures that way, we didn't go through a process where we would either confirm or not confirm. But neighborhood councils took that as acceptance that that was the rollover figure when, in fact, it wasn't. So <clears throat> what I've um, instructed my accounting staff to do is to go back from the very beginning of when each neighborhood council started receiving funds year by year, look at how much was allocated and actually given, how much was spent through the purchase card, how much was spent through petty cash and through the demand warrants, and uh, I'm hopeful that we can complete those calculations by mid-March if I don't lose any more staff to transfers. So uh, we should have accurate figures, um, which will then uh, confirm with the neighborhood councils if there are discrepancies between what neighborhood councils have and our accounting records, there will be an appeal process set up to so by March, then, you expect to have a complete reconciliation of each of the 90 neighborhood councils actual rollover funds so that they can then compare that to what they believe their rollover funds are and you'll be able to compare and contrast the strong caveat that I don't lose any more of my accounting staff to another department right okay um, now there's been much disagreement over the amount of the rollover funds that might be available uh, in the budget. Um, can you explain the $1.6 million figure that has been discussed? What does that represent and what's uh, and what correlation does that figure have to what the neighborhood councils may or may not believe is, is their current rollover total? Um, the 1.6 figure was um, what the CAO had confirmed as the remaining cash at the end of the last fiscal year, um, which again did not sync with our records because we didn't track data that way. Um, neighbor councils have their own understandings of what they either uh, took board action to encumber. Uh, we have never had a clear process that um, clarified that if a neighbor council encumbers funds that we track the funds that way. So um, we are uh, looking at Figure, once we can complete our accounting exercise, then that's really going to confirm the, the true rollover balance. Um, and then we can bring it back to council to reconcile any differences. Mr. Zahn? Uh, no questions. Okay. Um, you know, lastly, I... Go ahead. Um, also talked about outstanding contractual obligations. There are about 40 neighborhood councils that have um, office leases. So um, that would also be affected in any um, action that the council took in terms of rollover balances and future allocations of, of funds. Did you make an assessment of other contractual obligations other than leases and, and that sort of thing as well? No, just all the contracts that uh, came across our desk. 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We have a number of uh, speakers on this as well. Um, we'll start with uh, Joanne Ivaric Garb, followed by Mike Newhouse. Sorry. Thank you. Um, as Mr. Zion can attest, for the past five years, in our rollover has been the signs for West Hills, Welcome to West Hills. And it's taken five years, it's been on the rollover, it's been encumbered, and we still haven't gotten our West Hills signs because of approvals. Okay, so we have legitimate things that have been encumbered over the years. Um, when we realized what we were going, uh, what we may lose, uh, we have encumbered our funds. Now, I don't know about any other neighborhood council, but in order to get any money, it has to be written into the minutes, and the treasurer has to submit a report every month. We have a treasurer's report every month at our monthly meetings, and this is public knowledge. Um, uh, the purchase, the purchase cards, well, purchase cards, I'll get into the next one. Okay. I guess that's it. <laughs> let, me, let me respond to that, Mr. Chair. The, uh, Please. The West Hills Neighborhood Council was saving up dollars for introductory signs to West Hills. They had the signs, uh, uh, an architect, you would say, or an artist illustrate the signs. We finally approved that. They were compiling dollars for that in addition to radar, photo, uh, not photo radar, but uh, speed limit signs, the reflector, the, the, uh, the ones that actually show your speed as you're traveling down the road. And there was an agreement that I would pay for half and the neighborhood council would pay for half. So they've been saving dollars for both of those projects. I don't know of other neighborhood council activities, but I do know that uh, in the cases where the council office has been working with the neighborhood council to save dollars for those particular projects, which were more expensive than the annual allocation. Uh, there should be some type of provision if there is this uh, removal of the rollover that whatever was approved by the council office in coordination with the neighborhood councils should, should stand so they can complete those projects. And if there's more money after that, then that's another matter. But I know that in those two situations, the welcome to West Hills, and the speed signs, there was an approval. But we've been trying to save up enough money. It's like you want to buy a new car, you got to work hard, and that's what we're doing. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Mike Newhouse, followed by Glenn Bailey. Mike's not here. Is Glenn Bailey returned? No, then that brings up uh, our next speaker would be Mark Reddick, followed by Jose Aguilar. Mr. Reddick, Mr. Aguilar. Oh, Mr. Reddick. Front line. <laughs> now you show them. Okay, go ahead. Rub Thank it in. Council members, I'm Mark Reddick, Chair President of the Delray Neighborhood Council. Tonight I'm here as a citizen concerned. Concerned that in our zeal to cut the city's budget, we are throwing the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to the elimination of rollover funds for the neighborhood councils. Councils such as Delray, Westchester, and Mar Vista have all, by careful budgeting and prudent spending of the taxpayers' dollars, not by wasting them, have accrued some rollover funds. The elimination of rollover funds may result in future neighborhood councils spending their annual allocations in less than a prudent manner. In other words, thus creating a use it or lose it mentality. Additionally, the elimination of rollover funds currently budgeted will cause neighborhood councils not to keep promises made to their neighborhoods in the areas of outreach, community improvement, in our case, our annual LAPD Pacific Division community event. Breaking these promises would tear at the fabric of trust that the neighborhood councils have developed and fostered within our respective communities. We promised stakeholders a community that would be respected and not neglected. Help us keep that promise. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Jose Aguilar, followed by uh, Neodros Bridgeforth. Okay. Again, I agree with the previous speaker about use it or lose it. Um, I'm involved with the Lincoln Heights Christmas Parade, and that encumbers about maybe $10,000. And sometimes it takes a while for us to develop that kind of funding. It might take two or three cycles to get that funding because there's other competing interests that need the funding then and there. So we kind of like build up to it towards the end of the year. Um, now, 
with this use it or lose it mentality, I really don't even can begin to understand how we're going to be able to fund our parade. It creates a lot of complications to encumber $10,000 because it is a large portion of the budget and you have to build it up. And uh, the fact that we can't um, is uh, going to be very harmful to, to our community. Now, uh, I, I may not agree with how the neighborhood council spend their money. And, you know, I, I, I'm in 100 percent agreement. I mean, sometimes I get into some deliberations, but I believe that we should have this option of rollover funds, and uh, I and I oppose uh, you taking away our rollover funds. It's an act of political retaliation again, and uh, it's harmful to the community. Next speaker is uh, Neodros Bridgeforth, followed by Noel Weiss. Good afternoon. I'm Mildred Bridgeforth from the Hollow, uh, North Neighborhood Council, Harbor North Neighborhood Council. We have worked very hard to try to save our money and not overspend. However, with uh, them taking away our rollover funds, and we didn't even know about it until too late, we are not going to be able to finish doing a lot of the things that we need to do, such as even print our papers or our bulletins, send out our bulletins. Uh, we're not all able to get out. I'm not able to get out and walk from house to house and turn out bulletins now. And our funds uh, will not be enough to last us through June. And now that the uh, group that is going to take over the elections don't seem to be able to spend the money they want us to spend the money they're taking it away and we won't be able to spend it please don't cut us off thank you thank you okay oh, in, the interest, in the interest of uh, time here the, i don't think the charter again allows for you to take away the rollover funds um, when you debated 9 11 mr zion when you were on that commission um, you adopted a provision that said the mayor and council shall thereafter appropriate funds for the department and neighborhood councils at least one year in advance of each subsequent fiscal year. This precludes you from taking away any of the rollover funds. Number two, on the approval of contracts, section 902B of the charter says bonk shall, among other things, be responsible for approval of contracts and leases. It's right in the Charter. Has Bonk not been approving contracts and leases for the last, I don't know, however many years? Maybe we need to find that out. Maybe you need to have a list. We can get the neighborhood councils to do it for you. Uh, I'm sure probably in the next two weeks, if in fact that's possible. Um, but I got to tell you, um, I'm really hopeful that before anything is done, in all seriousness, there's a good hard look taken at the provisions of this charter, and the city attorney opines publicly, not privately. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more speaker on this item, uh, Chris Rao. Thank you, sir. Chris Rao. It's Rao. Rao, I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things based on what other people have said. To run the West Hills Neighborhood Council budget just at the beginning, we have an executive director we have to pay a salary to. We have a website, and that's how we, we do our outreach. So it's very important we maintain that. So right off the bat, $20,000 goes to our, our website, our newspaper, and our executive director, and other things like telephone lines and email. And then we have to... Um, I, I wanted to say city clerk elections it cost us over $2 million. They are doing no outreach, no vote by mail at all. So $5,000 or 3000 different neighborhood councils are spending different amounts. Right there, that's where our money is going this year. So, so bare minimum, $25,000. That's nothing else for our, our, you know, expenses to go. So we need our rollover to, to do some, fund some of these other things. Thank you. Thank you. I have no other, thank you, sir. I have no other public speakers on uh, item number two. Um, it's clear to me that, um, as I mentioned earlier there, this is a, this is a broken accounting system. 
and um, when there is such wide disparity between uh, what the neighborhood councils believe to be their rollover uh, amounts and what um, what bonk uh, I'm sorry what uh, Dunn's records indicate to be the rollover amounts um, this is a system that requires um, reform and I think that the coincidence of the budget situation now and the need for uh, funding in this fiscal year and this uh, uh, situation of, of great disparity provides us us with the opportunity to fix it um, but sweeping these funds into the reserve so that it would just be spent on general fund purposes uh, would not allow the neighborhood councils what they need in meeting their commitments that they have already made in reliance on what they believed to be their money um, what I want to recommend is this um, the unappropriated balance provides a balance if you will between those two objectives um, it allows the money uh, that is believed to be available in uh, in Dunn's uh, accounts to be used to help the city meet its current budget crisis uh, and address the deficit problem yet at the same time that's money that can still be uh, we can still have access to that to appropriate uh, for things that have been committed uh, by the neighborhood councils so any contracts any commitments that are evidenced by minutes uh, of the neighborhood council ongoing rent and lease and unpaid bills that haven't been processed by done those sorts of commitments uh, that neighborhood councils have made in reliance upon this money being available need to be honored uh, and so I it's going to be my recommendation uh, that we do move the balance of the account of approximately 1.6 million dollars into the UB account, the unappropriated uh, balance, subject to claims by the neighborhood councils for any of those expenses of the type that I mentioned that can be documented uh, and evidenced by, uh, uh, by um, some sort of uh, evidence on the record. Um, and that uh, I, I'm going to recommend to the council that uh, with, if I have concurrence, um, that the CAO, the CLA, and Dunn, in consultation with the neighborhood councils, prepare an implementation plan uh, to achieve this objective and report uh, to this committee about how they will implement, implement that plan uh, within uh, two weeks. I'd also recommend that uh, CLA, Dunn, and Bonk, in consultation with the neighborhood councils, uh, revisit the rollover policy uh, and create a process that will allow for rolling over of funds in an, uh, an appropriate level uh, that would include some verification process for ongoing future needs that would involve uh, approval by either Bonk or the council. And that will be that would be my recommendation. I second it. And without objection, that will be the recommendation of the council of this committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zine. That brings us to item uh, number three. Item number Gender. three is a motion: Krikorian, Han, Goret, Zine, Alicon, Labange, Wezar, relative to the consider relative to the consideration of eliminating the neighborhood council bank card system and convert to a demand warrant system. So item three, um, CAO is recommending that we eliminate the bank card system and convert to the demand warrant system. Um, as the controller's audit um, highlighted, um, the bank card system appears to be, pre appears to present the greatest uh, fiscal liability for the city. And um, there's many benefits and disadvantages of both um, the bank card system and the demand warrant system. Um, with the demand warrant system, it provides more controls over expenditures. The current system is set up where the funds are spent and we audit the funds after they've been spent. With the demand warrant system, neighborhood councils are required to justify how they're going to spend the money and then the city authorizes the payment. Um, Obviously, there are other disadvantages of the demand warrant system. Um, it is 
invoices will take longer to be paid. Um, and it, it, it also is, um, there's convenience issues. It's, it's very inconvenient and probably not user friendly. Um, and additionally, maybe more staff may be required to process the additional uh, demand warrants. So these are the challenges that are before your committee today is determining whether or not um, the, fiscal's, the city's fiscal liability is, is greater than some of these inconveniences. So, sorry, inconveniences, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I think I'd like first to ask Mr. Uh, Kim to come up and, and briefly describe uh, what the current process, procedure, and accountability system and limitations are with regard to bank cards. And then I'd like to ask the uh, city controller's representative to come up. Sure. Brumwood Kim, Neighborhood Empowerment. Currently, the policies and procedures for the bank card. Uh, neighborhood councils are allowed to spend up to $1,000 on the bank card um, and half of their total annual allocation. Um, they are required to submit uh, quarterly audits. So um, really the auditing uh, function is probably the weakest with the purchase cards because we only know three months after the fact. Um, and so we are uh, currently about 250 audits behind due to staffing shortages. And uh, frankly, since I've been in the department, we've never been current with the quarterly audits. So that, that is a main um, design weakness in terms of accountability for the purchase card. But um, it is a convenient way to, for neighborhood councils to pay for expenses. And uh, if we were to push all of the money through the demand warrants, then uh, workload issues and slowing down of neighborhood councils' abilities to pay bills would be the effect. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'd like to ask Ms. Bartels uh, of the controller's office to come up and talk about briefly about your audit findings on this issue and Relative your comment on the CAO's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Claire Bartels, Chief Deputy Controller, thank you for having me here this evening. Um, the controller's recent audit did not conclude that it was necessary or appropriate to abandon the bank card system. Rather, that there were, as the CAO pointed out, challenges with both the demand warrant and the bank um, cards, the purchasing cards. The, um, forgive me if I'm being repetitive, but it's important to note that the neighborhood councils currently have three ways of spending money. One is a petty cash system, access through the bank cards. One is credit cards for purchases up to $1,000. And the other is the request through the city controller, essentially through the department and ultimately the controller for a check, generally for um, vendors who don't accept credit card payments and or larger sums of money. I think that's important to note because what we're talking about here is um, perhaps we need a definition first of what the um, strict expen what the expenditures ought to be allowed by neighborhood councils, and then match up the best tool for those expenditures, um, or to effectuate those expenditures. Uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, yes, it has been quite an enjoyable afternoon here. <laughs> I apologize. Um, the bottom line is the controller is not recommending a complete conversion or abandonment of the bank card system to a demand warrant system, but rather to select the most appropriate one for the um, transaction at hand. Okay. What is the current limit on expenditures uh, by bank card by the neighborhood councils? It's $1,000 at a time per expenditure. I believe the department attempts to um, meet out, or their policy is to allot a quarter of the annual expenditure at a time. But it's, um, well, the point I wish to emphasize is that the bank cards, the problem isn't with bank cards themselves. It's with the lack of regulation, internal control, monitoring of internal controls, and the training on the use of them. Right. So the uh, recommendation by the department, or the acceptance of the recommendation by the controller by the department to limit the number of bank cards, for example, to impose restrictions which the bank cards are, access, are um, uh, programmable through the, the bank um, itself. You can control the types of transactions, the locations or the types of um, 
certain establishments, if you wish to rule them out from purchase, all those things can be done as an internal control. And, and we've we already on. implemented an internal control to prevent cash advances on the bank card. Is that correct? I do not know that. Our Mr. audit Mr. found Kim, otherwise. Mr. Kim so has indicated that that is correct since the time, uh, at least since the time of the audit. Would you agree that um, the expense to the city of processing warrants for expenditures of less than $1,000 is greater than continuing a bank card system to pay for those, those expenses? While we haven't done an analysis of the cost of any particular transaction, we would tend to agree, yes. Okay. So that abandoning the bank card uh, program altogether, let's set aside the issues of accounting, abandoning that system and expecting that neighborhood councils would have to pay for all of their expenses through warrant process would actually have an adverse effect on our budget deficit right now. It could indeed. Okay. Thank you. I have, thank you very much. You. I appreciate your being here. Um, and we have a number of cards on this item. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Zein, I didn't That's okay. give you the opportunity to That's okay. chime in. I was on a roll. I know you were. You were. Uh, since uh, Ms. Bartell and I have been here since 8 o'clock this morning for EERC, we're uh, going to plow till the end. Um, if you could please come up, Mr. Ms. Dunn. Bartels. Oh, I'm Mr. sorry. Mr. Dunn, Director. Can you can please come up. A couple questions for you. According to uh, item number three, um, finance charge. Are we paying finance charge on these credit card purchases? Or are we making the payments when the bills come through? Uh, there are finance charges for uh, cash withdrawals, but that's been what percent system. are we paying on finance charge? Mm, I've seen something like twelve dollars for every five hundred dollar cash withdrawal. And is there a fee to use that for a cash transaction? Yes, the the fee is charged to the neighborhood council account. All right, so we're going to eliminate the cash. That's been eliminated. Yes. Okay, now when the bill comes in on a credit card charge, you get a certain amount of days to pay that. If not, you're going to pay a finance charge and sometimes a penalty. Are we paying those promptly, or are we assessing finance charge and penalties uh, on those charges? Not um, we're not incurring penalty charges for late payments on the purchase card. No. So we're paying them on time? Yes. Okay. And then the, the other question I have, according to the Audit of Neighborhood Council's expenditures, Neighborhood Councils frequently violate Dunn's financial policies regarding expenditures, handling the cash and credit cards. $880,000 in purchases for which they have not submitted proper paperwork. Did we ever get that paperwork on the $880,000? Uh, no, we're currently in the process of implementing many of the recommendations from the uh, from the recent audit. One of them is freezing funds for neighborhood councils that have um, more than four quarters of outstanding audits, and uh, that's been implemented. But the one that you mentioned, um, we haven't gotten to yet. So there's a policy in place, financial policies regarding expenditures and handling, and neighborhood councils. It doesn't say how many. It just says frequently. Is that become common practice where they violate the established rules and regulations? I wouldn't say that it's common practice, um, but it's also not rare. There are some neighborhood councils that have admitted to me, for example, that they use the purchase card more than once to bypass the demand warrants because the demand warrant process is taking too long. So that's a clear violation of the policies. Problem on our side, of course, is that we can barely keep up, we can't even keep up with the payment of process, payment of processing payments, much less enforcing policies. And, and there's no regulation or no requirement that the treasurer submit a treasurer's report to the neighborhood council when they have their meetings. That's correct. So the treasurer does what the treasurer wishes to do, whether it's in compliance or not, and then the board doesn't get the information, so there's nothing they can really do. But that, that is a policy that I plan on implementing before April of uh, this year. Okay. Also, neighborhood councils frequently violate this policy, withdrawing over 45000 from 07 to 09. Have they been brought up to date that, has there been like a refresher course to say, these are the rules and regulations that you must comply with? Have we done something to the 90 to say, no, it's it's not the old style. We've come up to a new standard. Well, every time a new 
treasurer comes on board, we do provide that person with training, but um, sometimes they forget the rules, and uh, there are a few instances where uh, the tre and these are a few instances where the treasurer is uh, really not bringing the reports back to the neighborhood council boards. But I think with the policy that's established, that would become much better. Well, it sounds like the policy has been there; it hasn't been adhered to. So. The bank card, we can put restrictions on that bank card, what they can actually do. And, and is there a certain amount of money that they can draw from on that card, or is it just unlimited? For example, $1,000, I'm, I'm going to go today, then I'll go back tomorrow, go back the next day on a $3,000 purchase. I don't want to do the 3000 I want to just in, in the separate um, charges there, for the one purchase. For the one purchase, um, when we're able to catch it, Basically, you have to have somebody looking at the transaction on a daily basis, which gets to be challenging. There are instances that have come to my attention where clearly that's what was going on. In those cases, we froze the funds and asked the board to take action on, on um, keeping okay. the treasurer accountable. So, so we're not giving cash right now, and uh, the demand warrant sounds like it might be more complicated. It sounds like a credit card with tight restrictions. You say one credit card with tight restrictions might be the... Uh, way to go that would be my recommendation okay thank you and, Mr. and for the sake of the record uh, these are debit cards rather than credit cards are they not or are they credit cards they're what they uh, the city calls a purchase card which allows uh, neighborhood councils to um, uh, purchase expenses and it's it's not a credit card but it's not a debit card okay is it unique? It's a hybrid card. It's a hybrid card. <laughs> is, it unique to is it unique to government? Because I never heard of that. It's either a debit or a credit. I believe it's unique to government, yes. Claire, okay. is that unique to government, this card that they use? It's not a credit. It's not a debit. It's a hybrid card, the one that are... <laughs> it's is it strictly government use? Corporations? Okay. I had never heard of that. Okay. okay. Very well. Thank you very much. Um, all right. We have a number of cards on this matter. Has Glenn Bailey returned? Okay. Um, then the first speaker will be Tony Wilkinson, uh, followed by Chris Rowe. Tony Wilkinson from Panorama City. Uh, thank you very much for bringing this here. Uh, nobody has more interest in accurate accounting of funds than neighborhood councils themselves. Because as we can see, there are all sorts of uh, uh, punitive measures that are being suggested, one of which is suggested by the uh, chief administrative officer in this uh, uh, report, which is to do with our city budget crisis. Nothing could raise the costs more than to turn to an all-warrant system. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, what we really need desperately is oversight. That's one of the reasons as a partner with Dunn, the neighborhood councils have volunteered, recognizing the staff that Dunn is losing, to do whatever we can to work voluntarily to set up control systems and, and uh, labor systems to make this system work without having to dis dismantle what we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Chris Rowe, followed by Cindy Hench. Um, it's my understanding from our board treasurer that it takes three to six months to get something through the demand warrant system, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you asked earlier about the bags, if things can be bought in bulk. Region A, our elections are March 2nd. We joined together as a region, and we mailed out little mailer cards as a bulk you can be a candidate. This was not about individuals. This is not about individual NCs. It was the whole region, and we did that in bulk. Um, one thing that came up at VANC was that maybe we could have one laptop computer per neighborhood council with a program that's user-friendly, QuickBooks for Money, that would standardize how to easily implement our programs to, to generate that information to Dunn and Bonk and to the city controller so that you can understand and you can be transparent so that we are not being penalized. It doesn't look like we are um, you know, using money in a way we shouldn't be allocated. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Cindy Hench, followed by Joanne Ivana Garb. 
Hi, I'm glad that you're reconsidering the idea of getting rid of the bank card because the other day I went to mail something to Dunn and I used the credit card for seven dollars. So, you know, asking for a demand warrant to send the mail in to send in the audit, it's a little cumbersome. Um, another thing is I just wanted to point out that in terms of the financial accountability within many neighborhood councils, in our case we have in our bylaws that the treasurer has to provide the financial report to the board each month. So it is approved by the board. It's in our minutes. And I think that if you polled the neighborhood councils, you'd find that it's probably the majority that are doing the same thing. So, you know, there's there's a little bit of problem um, here. And I think we really need to help work with whoever you decide is going to solve the problems. You've got folks like me. I'm a CPA. I've been an auditor for a long, long time. Did all kinds of corporate accounting stuff. Been to done to help them out with some of these audits. But you've got some really great resources amongst the neighborhood council people to help you solve these problems. Thank you. The next speaker is Joanne Ivanek Garb, followed by D. Wiseman. You're going to be spelling my name in your sleep tonight. <laughs> Um, one thing I want to say about the purchase cards. Uh, I don't know if it's available online, but I know four years ago when I was back east and my husband was here, he was checking to see what I was spending with the credit cards <laughs> uh -huh. on, a da on a daily basis. Uh, wise wise man. man. the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> wise man. Okay. So, you know, he, he wanted to know, you know, why did you spend so much there? Well, I bought the kids' school clubs. Oh, okay, you know. So... I don't understand why they cannot be monitoring this on a daily basis to see if something is out of line. Okay, I know that there are other times that the thousand dollars, like when we, the nice bag that you got uh, from us. Well, we have no, to. No, this is from God at Granada Hills North. That's from Granada Hills, but you have gotten from West Hills Neighborhood Council. I collect them. It's yes. Okay. okay. Um, when we bought them. We got, we got such a deal that if we spent for 2,500 of them, they gave us free pens, okay? So, you know, you have to understand what's, what's going to be logical or not logical. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Dee Wiseman, followed by Mike Ogara. Thank you, sir. I think the key words are now in front of us. Transparency, volunteerism, and accuracy now five or six years ago i created a small excel program to take care of one of the councils i served on you have again in this room the volunteers who can do this it doesn't make any difference whether you use quickbooks quicken money a package program that we make that's packaged for us whether it's the credit cards whether it's an impress system it's all feasible by having our neighborhood council volunteers go and do it and help. Mr. Kim has told you that their department is woefully lacking in personnel and apparently in expertise. We have it for you. Call on us. Start it going. When you make these decisions, when you make these uh, reviews in two weeks, you use the words you want the consultation of the neighborhood councils. We're here. I want to see those neighborhood council volunteers be part of the process. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Mike O'Gara, followed by Agnes Lewis. Uh, I would not like to see this uh, go to an all-demand warrant system at all. Uh, uh, the paperwork involved would be just horrendous. Uh, I would not like to see us lose two credit cards either, because I have a credit card on the president of the Sun Valley Area Neighborhood Council, and our treasurer has one. But she has a family and a job, and I don't. So often I have to go with park people or something like that when we pick up candy for Halloween and things like that. So I would like to see us keep the two credit cards. And the other thing is, uh, we're talking about a sum of money for all the neighborhood councils, about $4 million. Uh, uh, somewhat over that. How many transactions are there actually being made each month? Because for my neighborhood council, uh, boy, if we had eight or 12 transactions, that would be a lot in a month. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Agnes Lewis. Agnes Lewis, Granada Hills North Neighborhood Council. Again, I would urge you to be careful not to spend a dollar trying to save a dime. Uh, 
you've uh, frozen petty cash, so can you imagine if every time we spend $3.12, we put it in for a demand warrant, which takes 8 to 12 weeks to process and costs a lot, uh, creates a lot of costs for the, uh, for the city. I uh, maintain that there is not enough exposure in the whole credit card system to be worth the additional cost to the city to make it demand warrants instead. Also, I think it's uh, largely, whatever issues there are right now with the treasurers, it's largely a training issue. I think most uh, uh, neighborhood councils, uh, as they have become more um, operational over time, have uh, handled a lot of these problems. Training issue. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no other speakers on item number three. Oh, Glenn. Thank you. Glenn, you woke Glenn up Bailey. or what? Sorry, I was upstairs at another meeting briefly. I apologize. Um, regarding the uh, bank, Glenn Bailey, Encino Neighborhood Council. Um, regarding the, um, the bank card system, I'm sure that the, co the comments regarding the um, cost effectiveness uh, have been addressed. Uh, the one thing I am really concerned about is it just seems to be no um, protection for the petty cash, and I certainly think that should not be part of it. It should just be used as a debit card, and it should be restricted based on the types of uh, things that you want it to be allowed for, not for community projects or the multiple transaction that it was used for. As long as that's a done rule, then it should not, you should put some protections in so that the, the split transaction things could not be done. And I think there must be in this day and age a way to program those cards so you, that you can avoid that. Thank you very much. Um, it, I think it's, it's clear that this is a, a policy recommendation rather than a budget recommendation. It, it's, even if fully implemented, it, it doesn't appear that it would realize actual savings, certainly in this budget year. Um, but, uh, but I do think that we've had a good discussion about the need for greater transparency and accountability, um, and especially in light of the, of the controller's uh, findings. Um, that should be able to be done with relatively little inconvenience to the neighborhood councils, I think. So uh, I would recommend uh, that the neighborhood councils submit a monthly accounting of their bank card expenditures uh, in order to retain their, their good standing with Dunn, um, that the uh, policy of eliminating the, the cash withdrawals and petty cash uh, be, uh, be implemented, and that, um, uh, that Dunn report back uh, to us uh, in two weeks about uh, how uh, those changes uh, will be implemented and how neighborhood councils will be informed to that effect. Second. And that will be the recommendation of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Zine. Um, that brings us to item number four. Item number four is a motion. Kokorian, Han, Koretz, Zine, Alakon, Labange, Wezar, relative to the consideration of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, City Attorney, and CAO evaluating and re redefining allowable expenditure categories for neighborhood council funds. Uh, Wilson Poon with the CAO's office. Um, item four is, as um, mentioned, it's a um, instruction for the CAO, CLA, I believe the city attorney and the uh, and Dunn to look at redefining the allowable expenditure categories for neighborhood councils. This is a, a measure we hope will um, provide more controls and prevent any opportunities for um, any type of misuse or misuse of public funds. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kim, do you have any comments on the CAO's recommendation? Okay. We do have one card on this item, Chris Rowe. Hi, Chris Rowe. Um, I, I don't agree with the idea of redefining allowable expenditures. I think we have here demonstrated that we have the common sense to figure out what's appropriate. And for example, one neighborhood council might be doing CERT training, another one might be doing some kind of major rebuild project. Someone said today that no neighborhood council one size fits all. So I, I don't want to be limited on 
what we can expend our money on. And I want to go back to the petty cash issue just real quickly and just say this. For people that spend out of their pocket for agendas or things that are necessary under the Brown Act, there has to be a method of reimbursement. And we don't all have access to the credit card. So therefore, that's what cash, petty cash is used for is reimbursement. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, again, this uh, is a really a policy recommendation that doesn't have an impact on the current uh, budget uh, shortfall, um, but it is a policy that has gotten considerable attention lately, especially in light of the controller's audit. Um, I think it is worth revisiting with the input of neighborhood councils uh, and Bonk uh, how the nature of expenditures might be uh, more narrowly crafted, not limited necessarily, but defined. And uh, so I would uh, recommend that the council request that Dunn, the city attorney, the CAO, and CLA, uh, in, in consultation with Bonk and the neighborhood councils, uh, evaluate and redefine, evaluate for redefinition the allowable expenditure category, uh, categories uh, for neighborhood councils and the possibility of a, uh, an appropriate percentage cap that might be put on different categories and then report back to this committee in 60 days on uh, that recommendation. Second. And that will be the recommendation of this committee. Thank you, Mr. Zine. And that f brings us finally to uh, item number five. Item number five is a motion. Krikorian, Hahn, Koretz, Zine, Alakon, Labange, and Wezar relative to consideration of the general manager of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment issuing a memo to neighborhood councils regarding a proposed 50% reduction to the annual allocation amount for fiscal year 2010 through 11. Wilson Poon with the CAO's office. Um, item five is instruction to the general manager to it, notify the neighborhood councils of a 50% reduction for next year's funding. Um, I want to be clear that this is not a reduction of this year's funding, but it is next year. And in the next couple of months, as our office works with the mayor's office to develop the, the budget for next year, we'll be facing a $400 million budget deficit, as you had mentioned. Um, this may be one of the options that we may need to consider um, in closing that budget deficit for next year. So the recommendation from our office is to instruct the general manager of Dunn to issue a memo to give the neighbor councils um, a heads up so that they can possibly you know, adjust their budgets if they need to for next year as well. It, um, any reduction to the funding level will require council approval and this action will come back to the this council um, during the budget and the annual budget process. So it's simply just to uh, get the uh, discussions initiated. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kim? Jesus. <clears throat> um, just some suggestions in terms of implementation. Um, usually we require neighbor councils to submit their budgets for approval by our department prior to the fiscal year. So there may be a timing issue if the council doesn't make a decision on next year's allocation that will delay, basically delay the process for them uh, allowing access to the funds because it will delay the uh, budget approval process. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Abram, did you want to provide some comment? Thank you. Al Abrams, Vice President, uh, Board of Neighborhood Commissioners. Um, the commission specifically um, came to a recommendation on this issue uh, in a letter to uh, City Council, and I'll just read it from the uh, letter. Uh, they would uh, recommend uh, an additional 10% cut in the annual Neighborhood Council funding program on top of the 10% cut already taken less than a year ago. Two, a 10% cut in the NC rollover monies uh, in, ten, in 2010. 
uh, and a 10 percent cut in staff for the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment above and beyond the deep staff and funding cuts that the department has already taken over the last 18 months. So that's uh, what the Commission has voted on as their recommendation. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, we have a number of car. Oh, Mr. Zine, did you want to ask any questions of <laughs> well, Mr. Abram or Mr. Well, just uh, briefly, the mayor creates a budget, brings it budget and finance. They go through the budget, ultimately comes to council. So the mayor's directive will decide initially what's going to go to neighborhood councils. And I've responded to a number of neighborhood council folks who sent me emails. And it states in the charter that we have neighborhood councils. It does not say if they get $1 or $1,000 or $45,000. So the amount that neighborhood councils receive is decided by the mayor and the city council. I think some neighborhood council folks think that there's an allocation that's guaranteed in the charter. There is no specific allocation. The mayor could say we're going to give you $500. And that's what it's going to be. So I just want to emphasize the fact that there's no specific amount. We don't want to gut the neighborhood council ability to do their programs, but there is no set amount. I know it was $50,000. It started with James Hahn. And as a charter commissioner, we never envisioned as a charter commission that there would be a specific allocation of dollars for neighborhood councils. And as the neighborhood council numbers have grown, that number allocation has also grown. But to make it very clear, whether it's 45 or 50 or some other amount, there is no specific dollar value in the charter. And you can read the charter to verify that. Thank you. All right, we have a number of cards, uh, starting with General Jeff and then uh, Chris Rowe. Good evening to the committee. My name is General Jeff. I'm a community activist for Skid Row. I'm also on the board of directors for the Downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council. Now, I could see if we were talking about a budget of $200 million, it's, it's easy to make a 50% cut. But when you talk about $45,000, um, 10% was cut last year. It makes sense to make another 10% cut this year, but no more than 15%. When you talk about the Downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council, you've got a lot of wonderful projects, such as the, all the green projects. You've got the uh, uh, artistic uh, uh, projects, including the support for the uh, neighborhood, uh, the Downtown Art Walk. But in Skid Row, the uh, Downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council is our only source of funding. It is not our primary source. It is our only source of funding. It is, to, to make that much of a substantial cut to that budget would actually be cutting off the lifeline to Skid Row. Please don't cut, our, cut us off. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Chris Rowe, followed by Robert Gelfand. Chris Rowe. In two weeks, we have elections in Region A. Last year, in March, I monitored elections twice at Piper Technical. I know that Noel Weiss did, and I know that other people from the neighborhood councils did that as well. It's something that you could utilize us for. It's, it's a cost that the city clerk is going to it's going to cost a lot to hire staff for the neighborhood council elections. That's where we can be utilized, is in efforts like that, working elections. So I would recommend that. And, and again, I reiterate, a bare minimum just to, to function is about $25,000. So to cut us back in half, I oppose. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robert Gelfand, followed by Mike Newhouse. OK, thank you. Um, one of the issues, uh, speaking to what uh, Representative Zine said at the very beginning about difficulties in meetings and so on, I think that it's desperately important that neighborhood council chairs and board members receive training in how to chair a meeting and how to behave in a meeting because a lot of times they just don't know. And the problem is Dunn talks about it, but in its you know, seven or eight or nine years, it's never really done it. We are developing those methods on our own. It's a, it's a completely different paradigm. Uh, it's a kind of a meshwork where we as neighborhood council people talk to each other and we train each other. And the bylaws uh, task force, of which I'm actually the chair, is a very good example of that. In my last 10 seconds, I'd just like to point out 
that the $400 million that you have to make up is a real crisis. I agree it's a horrible thing. It's about 6% of your total budget. The proposal that's been brought here is already, it's been cut 10% from last year. It's another 35% of the total. Uh, I won't even talk about the waste of having the clerk run elections. It's absolute an absurdity. Uh, taking 10% off our money, that's like a 40% cut from last year. It's fair. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Mike Newhouse, who I don't think is here, uh, followed by Stephen Knight. Uh, and then Glenn Bailey, followed by Tony Wilkinson. Glenn Bailey, for the record, I do oppose the cut in, to neighborhood councils. We didn't get any cost of living raises over the last five years, like a lot of other folks in the city. I realize a lot of people have had cutbacks, furloughs, et cetera. And to the extent that uh, city council and the mayor has cutbacks, you know, if you get a 10% cutback, I can't think that's unreasonable that neighborhood councils got a 10%, a further 10% cutback. But um, I want to make two comments. Number one, empower us to get um, grants and get income. Right now we can't get any monies into the city. We can't get donations. Um, we're restricted. So if we could go out and really solicit donations from the, the business community, from nonprofit uh, granting entities, that would, that would allow us to um, move our money, multiply our money. The second thing I'd like for you to consider is if you set a, a dollar amount of money for neighborhood council operations for the city, let's say four, may I finish the sentence? Finish the thought, sure. Uh, so let's say it's $4 million, to, and the population of the city is 4 million people. Think about equity in terms of how many, how much dollar per person based on the population of each neighborhood council. There's one neighborhood council that has as few as 3,000 stakeholders, another that's 10,000 stakeholders. There's other neighborhood councils that are up in the neighborhood of 100,000 stakeholders. And yet we're all being given the same amount of money supposedly to do the same sort of thing. Is that really equitable? Just think about that. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Tony Wilkinson, followed by uh, Sue Devandry. Thank you. Tony Wilkinson from Panorama City, where we're pushing 80,000 people. Uh, and, and I'm here uh, to ask not so much uh, – this is not a, a question of entitlement. We're all in this in the city together. We haven't faced anything like this ever. Uh, the neighborhood councils want to partner with the reduced done to support it with volunteers. But at this time when they're going to step up and do what we can to help save almost $4 million in city labor costs. This isn't the time when we can afford to reduce our budget because we've, we've got places we have to meet, we have to do outreach, uh, and we, we truly, uh, the reasonableness is if we can help you save the done staff, leave our budget alone so that we can do the work for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Sue Devandry, followed by Noel Weiss. Hi again. Um, Sue Devandry, Granada Hills North Neighborhood Council, actually brought a, a bag that we have made and that we give out at outreach um, events. And inside, you know, I actually made up um, this binder for you. It actually has in there our budgets that we have. We also have um, letters and different um, items that we have done in the past um, with the elections and stuff going on. Um, Granada Hills North is a, is a bedroom community. Uh, we are full of residents and very few businesses. In fact, we only have two supermarkets and a few businesses surrounding them in a shopping center. That is it. We don't have a meeting hall. We don't have a library. We don't have a police station. We don't have anything that where we could meet as a group. When I became um, outreach chair, uh, we were having the outreach meetings at our house, at my house. And we were told that we couldn't do that because it was an ADA compliant. And all of our committees could not hold um, meetings in houses. And so we had to go out and we had to get, I'm sorry, we had to get an office. That office now costs us $15,000 a year in a lease. Um, if we didn't have the office, we would not be able to have committee meetings whatsoever. Also, um, when we put out newsletters, it, it's $5,000 for a newsletter. 
Uh, we have a website master that doesn't cost very much, but it, I mean, all these things do add up. And I don't see how um, we, we already cut us 10% last year. It's going to be another 50%. That's 60% of our budget you're going to be cutting, and I, we just can't, we can't Thank function you. like that. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. much. Next speaker is Noah Weiss, uh, followed by Dee Weissman. This is why the charter was written as it was. You cannot ignore the law. It's blatantly lawless. And somebody, some, I'm hoping on the city council, will ask the city attorney for a written opinion on this. Again, I'm going to, the, these funds, once they're appropriated, Mr. Zine is right, but it's, he's only half right. Once the money is appropriated, it's like in a lockbox. It is a special fund. The section 911 says that once it's there, you can't touch it. You can appropriate a lower amount for the next subsequent fiscal year. Well, we're in the current fiscal year 09010. The subsequent fiscal year is 1011. You can appropriate and you want to cut, then cut for 1112. That gives these people, that's what basically the charter says. And anything contrary to that is going to be a major, major problem for the city um, because these neighborhood councils, they have made commitments. Uh, and, and more importantly, if you have before you a proposal to save the city $4 million, all you have but keep the 45 and keep the rollover, why wouldn't you accept that proposal? It, it, I, I mean, it makes no sense not to. Next speaker is uh, Dee Wiseman, followed by Nina Royal. My honorable council members, this is a long afternoon. This is an exercise in futility, in waste of our time and your time. We're talking chicken feed here. Compared to the big problems, this is small potatoes. We already have the treasurers meeting with Mr. Kim regularly. Let's let them really be active in doing the job, making the recommendations, and probably doing some of the legwork that Dunn so desperately needs. The rest of us here are volunteering and are going to be meeting on Friday afternoon with uh, representatives of the mayor in order to bring our ideas to you. Please listen to us. Please accept our offers of help. Um, I'm less concerned with the dollars that have been spoken of here as I am with the relationships that have been established here. Let's maintain those relationships and improve them. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Nina Royal, followed by Doug Epperhardt. It's a hot mic. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, Sunland Hunga. <laughs> Sunland Hunga could have been two separate neighborhood councils. It would have cost you $100,000 instead of 50000 But we're a united group, so we decided to work together. Our neighborhood councils have bought an LPR car for the police department, a, a, a surveillance van for the police department. Um, we, we bought cameras. We don't spend this money on ourselves. We have done basically no community improvement. We have used our money to fight off bad decisions by City Hall and land use uh, decisions where it costs money to do outreach, to do um, printouts, uh, best services for Home Depot. That's how we've spent our money. Now, you're going to take that money away from us. It's, no, it's not right. So please, keep that money. We need it. Thank you. Doug Epperhart. And that's the last card I have as of this moment. I don't want to surprise you, but I'm actually going to speak to the motion. Um, what you have here is the uh, CAO and presumably his boss wanting you to collude in telling the neighborhood councils that they're going to get their funds chopped by half next year. Because that's really what we're talking about. He's looking for an ally in this, and he expects you all to go along. You don't have to. Simple one? Oh, no. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask the city attorney to comment on uh, Mr. Weiss's uh, concerns about Section 911 and um, how that impacts the ability to adjust the budget for a given fiscal year. Well, as uh, Council Member Zine pointed out, that the city council could give a dollar a year if, if they wanted to. But um, We've had a, a, a rollover policy which has said after so many years, you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, there's certainly, it's, it's debatable, but this is city money and the city can 
sweep accounts if it needs to sweep accounts. And so I think, uh, unlike what Mr. Weiss said, 9-11 in the Charter does not say that you cannot sweep it, but the money, if, if that's what my understanding is of his issue. Uh, I think it, it had more to do with changes in an appropriated uh, amount for the annual allocation. Um, no, can that be done uh, nine, in, in the middle of a fiscal year? Can it be done for the following fiscal year? Does it need to be done f a full year ahead of well, the fiscal Well, it, it, it needs to be done when the money is appropriated for the next fiscal year. That's the way the Charter reads. So it, it says, the mayor and the council shall thereafter appropriate funds for the department and neighborhood councils at least one year in advance of such subsequent fis of each subsequent fiscal year. So one year in advance. So, so essentially so you have to give 12 months notice then to the neighborhood councils. When, okay. you're, when you're appropriating the money to the neighborhood councils, you decide on what you want to appropriate for that next fiscal year. That's wait, right. we, we appropriate that money year at a time. Right. You're using Mr. Weiss's statement. They would be guaranteed that money for two years. No. Because the, the, we start the discussion in April. We start the budget July 1st. Right. There's not a year between April and July. It's three months. And that's reading that language. It sounds like you're talking about a year, a year is 12 months. It's not three months. Right. But we don't budget two years at a time. We budget one fiscal year at a time. No, we don't. No. We budget one year at a time. Well, we're not going to have a dialogue, um, but the, the, the point is that, as I understood that language, uh, it means that Essentially, we have to give more than a year's notice to make a change in what has been appropriated a year prior to the beginning of the fiscal year in order to make a change in that appropriation. That's the way it reads. The mayor right. and council shall thereafter appropriate funds for the department and the neighborhood councils at least one year in advance of each subsequent fiscal year. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Yes. Chairman, if I Please. may, Terry Sauer from the CAO's office, um, not to get into the gory details, but as part of each year's budget, there is a nominal amount set aside within the Neighborhood Empowerment Trust Fund for the next fiscal year to satisfy that requirement. And then as we move through the budget process, you know, that we adjust it as we prepare the budget. But there is something, there is a small amount set aside. Um, in the trust fund every year um, for future years, but it's a, it's a nom it's a nominal amount because we really can't project that far out. Yeah. So what what she's saying is that all that that money is put in to the neighborhood council trust fund, which is one bundle of money, including Dunn and the neighborhood councils. So if we wanted to, or the mayor wished to lower that amount. From forty-five to forty thousand dollars, could that take effect July first of twenty ten, or would it have to take effect July first of twenty eleven? That's the question, Terry. Well, and if I could dovetail on that question, it sounds to me from this explanation I just heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we would not be able to change the amount appropriated. But how that's allocated as between Dunn and neighborhood councils could be revised. I would, in terms of the budget, we budget on an annual basis. So for next fiscal, for example, for next fiscal year, the fund, the money for the funding program is set aside on an annual basis and is appropriated on an annual basis, and the council would take um, action, as was the case with the, in in the current fiscal year with the reduction to the forty five thousand, um, and that was all done through the annual budget process. I and I defer to the city attorney on this. I do not believe that that means that we would have to do that a year in advance. In other words, whatever change we make would be Ju July 1 of uh, 2011. 
that if the council approved it as part of the budget process, it could take effect on July 1, 2010. But again, I defer to the city attorney on. I'm just reading the code. Okay. I, I know they've been doing well, it on an annual. All right, basis. I'm going to I'm going to try to. It's, I'm going to try to. Cut this short then, because I think um, my yeah. <laughs> um, uh, my recommendation then is going to have to be. Uh, well, let me let me preface this. Uh, on on the merits, I think everything that we've heard today about the uh, value of the expenditures that are made by neighborhood councils uh, exactly comports with what my experience with the neighborhood councils in my own district has been and, and elsewhere. And I think, you know, this is one of those areas where if we aren't extremely careful, uh, we run the risk of ending up uh, costing much more to the city than we save by making deep, draconian, uh, devastating cutbacks, really, in the neighborhood council program. I know that there are examples in my own district uh, where a tiny amount of seed money uh, was spent by a neighborhood council to go out and get grants which resulted in many 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 multiples of that amount of money and uh, I can tell you from my experience in the state legislature I get very frustrated with making short-term cuts that end up costing us far more in the long term and I think devastating the neighborhood council program is exactly that kind of short-term thinking that's not good for the f ongoing fiscal health of this city. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to take it one step further, though. Because of this information that, that we're developing here, that I'm not comfortable with uh, the, the clarity of that information right now regarding the limitations on the council uh, and the mayor pursuant to the charter. <coughs> Rather than making an alternative recommendation at this point, my recommendation is going to be that we simply reject uh, this part of the uh, CAO's recommendation and just leave it at that and call it a day. Now, and, and uh, if, unless Mr. Zion objects, that will be the recommendation of this committee. I do want to say I think it's, it's important that we get to the bottom of this because, frankly, uh, folks, I'd love to say that we're done with this discussion. There is no way we're done with this discussion. Um, the city continues to have, um, wor almost on a daily basis, worsening uh, problems with our deficit. And this is going to be an ongoing issue that we're going to have to wrestle with together. Um, and I'm sure the CAO will come back with recommendations. In fact, I you know, welcome further recommendations for how we can create more cost efficiencies. And I know that all the people that I've spoken with in the Neighborhood Council movement have said, we're willing to do our part. We're willing to try to make some cuts, some restrictions in order to help the city through these difficult times. Just don't devastate the program. Don't use this as an opportunity to cut our legs out uh, and and eliminate the effectiveness of neighborhood councils and that's that's the sweet spot where I think we all need to try to get to um, but as of right now unless we are able to resolve this issue with the charter uh, language um, I'm not prepared to, to make an alternative recommendation at this time other than to simply say no so uh, with that I think we are finished unless Anything else? Anything else? All right, Mr. Zine, anything further from from you? Any Bring other comments? <laughs> all right. Well, I want to thank you all for sticking with us throughout a very long and, and challenging meeting, and thank you for your, your work and your commitment to our city.